I'll start off just kind of talk about it. Everything else then I'll introduce you. Say your last name again. Wire. Like Wire. Sister Barb. I, Bob Wire. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because I keep saying in my head, I know it's Wire, but I keep saying it's Weir, and I'm like, damn it, I know that's wrong. We're, we're live right now? There we go. All right, let me move this up. All right, we're live. We're here on Ants Marching today, and uh, a couple things I want to do before we introduce our guest, and uh, like Barb Wire, just keep that in my mind right now. Thank you for that, Barry. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of things went in to do this. There's a lot of people that have helped me you know, get to where I am today, um, as far as doing this podcast and going live and making this all happen, there's been I, countless hours, and that seems generic to say, but making this studio, getting the room ready, getting everything <laughs> going, uh, just having the things that, even the decorations, whatever, the microphones and things, this, this week we had a computer crash, we tested out, you know, Brandon over here, and uh, he was over taking care of our stuff. He got it done last minute, came in from the FBLA on that tonight. You know, but I uh, I really want to thank a couple of people today because I don't think you guys know this. I am awful at numbers. I'm awful at dates, anything else. I just don't put it together. I don't compute. And uh, Andy and Tony Hubs, the Hubs family, are picking up my son in Little Rock for me right now. Because normally on Fridays, I don't get back till 8.30. And it was, uh, I said, oh, let's do it at 7.30. 7.30 is good. 7.30 is great and everything else. And, uh, yeah, that's not, wasn't great. So, the last minute, they went and got Talon. He's on his way back right now. But, uh, you know, both uh, Annie and Tony, you know, if we're going to pick up my son besides today, the their whole family is a great thing for my gym. Their kids do my class. Two of their kids take care of the class. You know, help me out with class and everything else. So, I really want to thank Andy and Tony Hubs, the whole family. You know, Allie, um, Hannah, Allie, Justin, and Kylie, you know, for just, just for what they've done for me and everything else. A couple other people I just want to, you know, give a little bit of shout out here to. Um, a couple people from the gym. My CPA and my mom, when my mom's in Ohio, is Carrie Gibson. And uh, Carrie takes care of me and kind of keeps me in line. And <laughs> she's, she's, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she has a tough task with me, so... And not anybody that's ever met me or whatever talks to me, that's understandable either way. But um, but Carrie and her family, Madison and Emily and, you know, Rachel and their husband, you know, Scott, you know, they, they've been a big part of my gym, been part of my life since I've been here in Jonesboro. And it, it's awesome. I just want to say thank you to all of them, you know, and and uh, give a couple another shout out to David Hodges and a Angie Hodges, his wife and um all of them, you know, the Hodges family has been big, big backing of me, you know, to, for David and his family not to know me and to kind of embrace me. And they've always invited me to Christmas. They always invited me to everything. And, and it's, it's, it's awesome to have them as friends. It's awesome to have them as people that when you're from the North and you're from somewhere else, you know, you, you don't feel like you belong, you don't, and they've made it very comfortable for me at all times, including the Gibsons family, as well as, as well as Chris Booker, uh, he's a very good friend of mine, friend of the gym, help him get in shape and everything else, he's become a very good friend, a person that I, I truly, you know, I don't call too many people friends, but I, I love him as a brother, and he's, he's a good dude, and, um, also, uh, Tracy Smith, and, uh, Gail Smith, and their, bro their little boy, Dakota, um, a couple of years ago, I went on a kind of a hiatus and man, I was like, man, I want to disappear from society. I just, I'm just, I want to find out life. And it was one of those times where, you know, for my thirties and the third, my years of 30 years old to 40 year olds, I guess, um, I, uh, material things were important and those material things kind of added up and it just, you know through divorces and everything else, you know, Tracy and them, they understood what I was trying to accomplish is kind of get re-centered and everything else. And Tracy and Gail and Dakota, you know, keep me as friends and family. And, you know, they let me live their, their, on their land and everything else. And it was great, you know. So I appreciate Tracy and them for helping me out. And then the last guy is one of my longest friends here. One of the first guys I met when I came to Jonesboro is Scott McDaniel, who he'll be here on the, the podcast Sunday actually interviewing me that'll be sunday this sunday at 8 30 um 
and he's just been a good friend, a good mentor to me. He's the like he's the American poet. He does poetry. He's got poetry reading in New York. Wow. He's part of he's part of Jonesboro's like city council. You know, he's there's getting ready to do a tax thing where there was a big deal where they're going to make this jail instead wow. of making this park. You know, because there's really no culture. There's really nothing here in Jonesboro yet. Okay. Nothing, nothing they can own. It's all commercialized. It's all Olive Garden, Red Lobster, and everybody. You know, and that's great to have those places and everything else. But Scott's really working to bring some type of culture here and some type of transition. And Scott's been my friend since, you know, I, since I remember coming here 10, 12 years ago to Jonesboro. And now we're here at my house. And uh, I want to introduce my guest, Michelle Wire. Yes, yeah, see, yes, see they, that's only because their son, <laughs> not their son, but their the husband Barry here, uh, Barry Senior, has told me Bob Wire. You know, I have I have trouble, with, and I, I've talked to you many times, and we've we've discussed everything else. But Michelle here, you know, she's part of the uh, All American Redheads. She's in the Hall of Fame. She's you know done countless things through it. Her story. Every time I've talked to you. It's really been awesome. It's really oh, every you. time. We, thank you for having me. I no, I, I really appreciate you being here and, and, and being the first guest on <laughs> well, Ants Marching. Much. And the point of this podcast is kind of like it's my way of being social, I guess. Because the people I want to talk to are the people that are, are like you. You have such a dynamic story. You, there's so many. There's so many chapters <laughs> to, has, to your book. Mary has told me numerous times you need to write a book, and I'm like, oh, people would just die. <laughs> well, it, well, and, and like you said, you know, we, he didn't even know that you were part of the marriage. No, he did oh, not. And we, I don't think he knew about him. We'd been married maybe a couple years before he was ever introduced to him. And that's crazy. That's yeah. one of the first things most people, and that's a good thing too. That's one of those things where that's a comfort for you. Yes. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I just, not that I wasn't proud that I played with them and, and was part of that history making, just the fact that that was something I did. I, I loved basketball. I started playing when I was in the fourth grade. Uh, my parents supported me. I come from a humongous family. I have six brothers and six sisters, and I am 10 of 13, so my mom made sure I got to practice, and, you know, she was just like, if this is what you're going to do. And so she even supported me during the, I got pregnant my sophomore year in high school. She was just, I wanted to quit school. You're not quitting school. You're going for your education. Hold your head up and go. People make mistakes. Not that my children are a mistake because children are not a mistake. They are a gift from God. Uh, just that she just continued to support me and pushed me. Uh, went back to school after I had him. Uh, I stayed out six weeks. Went back. I went right back to playing basketball. It was like I never missed it. And, I mean, so he grew up with me playing basketball. Yeah. And I was 17. Got a scholarship, actually, to play at what was uh, MCCC in Blavel, Mississippi County Community College. That's right. That's right. Um, got a scholarship. Went and played. Two white girls on the team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was a starter. My mother came and watched me play. Brought my child to watch me play. And... Uh, my dad, she called me. I was at college, and she called me. My dad had had a massive heart attack. Uh, I had to make a decision. Do I stay in college, or do I go home and help my family? Went home to help my family. Uh, so I quit college, went home to help my family. No, what, what was your family like, you know, as far as, like, was it a farming community? Was my it dad a did farm. He farmed, and he drove a truck, and he was... Just luckily, he was coming into Jonesboro when he started having chest pain. Mm -hmm. uh, pulled over to the hospital there. It used to be uh, what is now NEA Baptist, where they used to be out on the main on the interstate. Pulled in there. I think it was the Methodist at that point. I'm not sure. Pulled in there, and he had had a heart attack. And so, you know, here at 17, I needed to make a decision. What do I do? So I quit college. Not you know, only seventeen, but seventeen with a with a child, uh, with, with, a child yeah, with a what with a four child. at that time, four year old, five uh, year old. He was born in eighty three, so just a couple years old. Yeah, you know, so, so uh, went home, uh, got a job, went back home, got a job. Uh, I was offered to go play with the All American Redheads, and I thought. Now, what were you doing, though? I worked in a grocery store. Yeah, you are working in a grocery store. Didn't he come to the grocery store? Cause he, he, well, he, he lived there in the town. Mr. Moore lived there in our town. Oh, really? I didn't? Town. Okay. Yeah, he's from Caraway. And he actually bought the team from um, a, 
Mr. Um, Olson. Olson out of Cassville, Missouri. So he bought the team from him and moved it to Caraway. So it had actually started in 1936, and he was coaching them. Him and his, his wife played, and he coached. Uh, he offered, actually, he offered me a position right out of high school. No, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I've got a child i got to support. I can't do this. So after my dad's heart attack, he come again. Here he come knocking on the door. Hey, you know, I need, I need you to go play. And I'm like, no, I'm not going. And my mom came and she said, if you don't go, you will regret it the rest of your life. I said, I have a two-year-old. She said, I'll take care of him. You want, I mean, you know, I'm thinking, my mom's raged children. She well, yeah, she's raised. already got 13. <laughs> you know, she's already, more, more than that's the, you know, that's amazing in itself. And, uh, that's like my family, so that farmers. She, she said, I will make sure that he's taken care of. You go play basketball. We got paid $500 a month. I'm thinking that's a big income for me. Well, that's a big <laughs> deal back in the 80s, though. People yes, can't relate to that now. But Went and played, um, got on a bus in Memphis, traveled across all the way to New Mexico. And my dad, I can remember my dad telling the driver, whatever you do, she has to stay in that front seat. She is not to be moved from that front seat. When you switch drivers, you tell them. That they were no, exactly about how you were 17? That Well, I was 17, and that he needed to make sure that I was going to be protected on that bus. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. 17 in the 80s is a young girl going from Memphis to New Mexico, right? Going from a small town in Caraway yeah. to New Mexico. <laughs> Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'd never yeah. even heard of I, I mean, I heard about it in school, but I'd never thought that I would be going. And he told the driver, he said, you tell the driver that takes your spot. He is to protect her. He is to watch her. Nothing is to happen to her. And they didn't. I mean, I was the very last one off the bus. Matter of fact, he'd say, you sit right there until everybody's off the bus. And then I would get off, do what I needed to during do. During the breaks, like you during guys the breaks, during the, the breaks. Bus. Yes. Yeah, he would check on you. Because, yes. Because here, actually, uh, what I'm thinking of is the, the Barn Storming America the, 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 with all American redheads mm -hmm. and everything else. The book that you're in, and there's several books, and we'll talk about the new book that's getting made right now, and there's uh, Breaking the Press, and you're also in the Cajuns Magazine of Jonesboro. Yes. But it, the, the story is, like, I was reading it, and just, the guy, the bus drivers would, when you take a break, they would kind of follow you around and yes, be right behind you. Yes, make sure I got off the bus, I'd go a lot to the store that they stopped at, get me something to eat, go to the bathroom, and... I would be the first one back on the bus. He would not allow anybody else on the bus till I was on the bus. Make sure that I was in my seat. Now, do because, you think it was the fear of God your father put, or do you think uh, there was a tip, or do you think that... <laughs> I just think my dad probably, I mean, you know, yeah. because he was, he was very stern about his children. He, I mean, my family is a very loving, and I'm not saying other families aren't, and we were just very loving. We never left the house. We didn't tell our parents we loved them uh, and, and all of that. Even when we were married and moved off, if we called our family, and we still do to the day, even our siblings, even as siblings, when we call one another, it's, we love you, have a good day, bye. You know, it, we were just, my dad always said, blood is thicker than water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your family's going to be there when nobody else is. Some families, that's true. Some, it's not. Some families can walk away and never think twice about it. Mine will not. We can fight with each other. And, I mean, when I say fight, we would fist fight. But if very decided to do something to me, my family would be on there. We'll be on down. There. Yeah, I mean, my family would be there to back us up 110%. So anyway, I got to New Mexico. I thought, okay, I need to get some rest. No. He picked me up. We went to the gym. I started training. So yeah, I but, but here's the thing. What people don't know about the All-American Red Hackets, it wasn't like you, ju you just played basketball. No. And it wasn't like you, and that's another thing that most people don't maybe not know about the All-American Reds. You played against men. We played against men, yeah. But you would train, and I'm going to let you, but there was tricks. There yes. was, the, you guys put on shows yes. as been, you're playing the game. Yes. Well, the men were in the locker room, that's crazy. Explain well, that. Well, okay, so I had to learn, I had to, to learn to do a trick shot. So my trick shot was I could shoot off my knee and I could shoot off my elbow. I can still shoot off my elbow. I'm not <laughs> sure I can make it with my knee, but I can still shoot off my elbow. The first person you ran into. And, uh, but yeah, the, one of the first girls I ran into was a high school girl from Marmaduke who I played against in high school. Really? We were big competitors. 
And I just so you were like myself. the elite of Caraway, she's the elite of yes. Marmaduke, and yes. so like you guys play, and then you guys were on the same team together. We were on the same team, which is awesome. My but, yeah. thought was, I'm glad she's on my team because I knew how she played. Yeah. So anyway, so we get to the gym, and he, so I start training, and I'm like, I had to learn to do tricks, I had to learn to do trick shots, I had to learn plays that I'd never known before. And when you train with the redheads, I remember we're in New Mexico. It's hot. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is before air AC yeah, yes, central air van. was in there. Yeah, there was yes, the. Our van. They might have had a fan, <laughs> maybe. Maybe in the van, because I, I remember our windows coming down. Anyway, so <laughs> he drops us off, and he drives five miles up the road, and he waits on us. We have to jog. That, to go get. Yes, that's our training. We have to run, or he would get behind you in the van, and you would run. Now isn't okay. Is it now? Is that the wagon that's in the Hall of Fame? Now I didn't ride in the wagons. We okay. actually had that a van before. in the okay, you had a van. Those, those, the white one is actually in the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. The red one, what they call Big Red, the owner has it at Caraway, and okay. yes, that it is up for sale actually. So you know, if somebody wants to restore it. A little bit of a piece of history right there. It is. And okay, so. Before we move on with you, and I'm not trying to break up the story, but we're we're going to kind of generalize this here. Okay, so you you you're playing for the Redheads, and you meet your friend, not a friend at that time, you know. But see, that's the thing. Like when you when you go from being high school competitors to being on the same team, you know. I know from my athletic experience and everything else, and especially now, it's different. Probably then, then it was maybe a little bit ruder, a little bit more well, harsh. You were- you were. It was just like, mm. but it wasn't just her. It was a girl from that played at Valley View that I had played against in high school. So there was, and then there was a girl from my own high school. She because the there. owner was bringing all the people he knew from Arkansas, right? right? Because, yeah. Well, just anybody that would play, he would. They would travel the country to find girls to play. When I literally said, "There's girls from all over the states," mm. and we were. It, so here we were. We were in New Mexico, and we were kind of coming up the West Coast, going that way, and. You know, you just learn the tricks. And me and I heard a lot of stories from the older groups that played in the seventies and sixties, and the men were more respective. By the eighties, the men were not so respected. They are not letting a woman beat them. Yeah. I mean, I had black eyes where I'd been elbowed. I had twisted my ankles. They would. I mean, they played competitive with us. Our record was a hundred and seventeen. I think we won one hundred and seventeen games out of four, and we lost fourteen. And so they knew, okay, so let, let's just stop right there because you're playing men yeah. in the 80s. And that's kind of what I was saying. It, it's different when you, like in the 80s, even the 90s, and when I was playing college football in the early 2000s, late 90s, like we didn't like, like I was like, I'm beating your ass, man. I'm on, like, I'm on, I don't care about your career. I don't care. We're winning, blah, blah, blah. And now it's changed to it's a friend. Everybody understands we're all athletes and everything, and that's the way it should have been. Right. But that you guys had to go through a little bit of adversity, just as women in itself playing in a professional league. Yeah. That's that's one aspect of that. But then playing men and beating men. Oh yeah. You know that's that's a complete like so like do you have any <laughs> like <laughs> besides the black eyes? What what was that like? I mean, how did they treat you? Well, I mean. When we were on the court, they just played competitive. They played like we were men. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and you watch high school and college basketball back then, and men were throwing elbows. And so that was something like, I was like, did he just really punch me? You know, because it's like, wham. And I thought, oh, he did. But that's okay, because I have a, a method that I'm fixing to hurt him with. Because as women, you were taught a trick in playing basketball <laughs> against men. So... I go up for the rebound, and he's behind me, and what do I do? I rump him with my butt right in the midsection, and he falls to his knees. <laughs> hey, I, I can my dad saying, sis, do you know you hurt him? I said, I don't care. <laughs> he was hurting me. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, and he was like, you dropped him to his knees. You hit him where it counts. And I said, yeah, he'll stay off my back next time, won't he? Mm-hmm. But you just had to get that mentality that they were not going to outdo you. And you were right. You said it earlier that we had to do halftime tricks. We didn't get to take a break. We performed. I mean, we had a trick where there was four of us, and we had each of us had two balls, and we would go in and out of each other's legs, bouncing the balls. We'd had to learn to spin two balls on each one of our fingers. 
Something. Which here, what's what's awesome about this is that people that don't know, and we'll we'll go over the books, and I'll, I'll repeat the books before we end this. But you're palming basketballs oh, yeah. in the eighties, yeah. Like, and, 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 like people oh, don't I palmed them balls in the, in two thousand. Well, even <laughs> now, though, even now, but I mean, yeah. because you got to think like like the way I think of it, I I had no clue about this until I met you. I had no clue about this. I'm from the north and everything else, and in which you played in the north, you played in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and all those all those other places. But you never seen that, and when you see you in your jersey and the redheads <laughs> holding the basketballs out to the side, that's impressive. And then I, that's impressive today, you know, to have to have a woman do that in the WNBA or whatever, right? You know, but somebody back then like that, and so you had to elevate your game. Oh yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I'm gonna be like, you guys were a bunch of hard asses. <laughs> You we're, guys, we're you guys took some, you get bruises, we beaten. We took bruises because, and then, you know, we took going, some knockings. Yeah, going back to what just what you're saying is, it's like, okay, so you play the first half. Mm -hmm. After you train four or five hours already that day, correct? Because yes. your coach yes. was a hard ass. I mean, yes. that's the way it was. Yes, you trained the day. I mean, and there was, like, Saturdays, you played two games on Saturday. You played one in the morning and one in the evening. And it might have been in a different town, so you would play that morning, get Get on the van and travel to your next town. I'm a free again. Madonna. I'm a I'm a I'm a big I mean, big. There were literally times that we slept in the van because we knew we had to get to the next town, and that was that's how you learned to do it. You would learn to sleep in the van so you could get to the next town. So we would drive all night to get to the next town. And you know, just getting there, just hoping, thinking, okay, we need to get there in time to get dressed and practice, go over our routine before the. The While well, the people that you were playing we're are their at their hometown, their home gym, their home beds. <laughs> yes. They're doing their own thing. You were driving all night, going stopping in the middle of the night for gas, have you gotta use restroom you know. I, I understand somewhat I played arena and somewhat traveling team like that, but not like this. Right. That that's I mean, that's a pioneer thing. That's 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 a lot. So you figure the ladies that played in the thirties, the forties, the fifties and sixties and seventies, and even the the early 80s, they were doing it then before I played in the mid 80s. So they, even the ladies that were playing in the 30s and 40s, they got to go to the Philippines. They literally were left in the Philippines. The redheads were left. The ladies, now the men came home. So a war or something broke out there. They left the women. The women had to figure out how to get home on their own. The men came home. The coaches left them there. So these women had to fend for themselves in the Philippines so they could get home. And so... You're taking a woman who was told that to play basketball back in the 30s and 40s would hurt your reproductive system. And they started out, they weren't even running when they first started playing. And then it migrates into, and they're playing men then, to full-blown full court. We were playing full court before full court was ever... A, a, yeah, because... They were playing full court. Now, full court had started before I finished high school. Full court for me started my junior high year in the seventh grade. So, I knew what Okay, so explain that. Was it was to people that don't know, and I, I really don't know. Okay, so, so when we women, first... When we first Was started, it women or just men? Uh, when I played... Say I was playing third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. You okay. played three on three. Three on one end, offense on one end, defense on the other. You didn't cross the center line. Oh, really? Yeah. You didn't cross. And so then when they started playing five on five, then you had to migrate to where you could play full court. That didn't start for me till I was in the seventh grade. So my prior years up to seventh grade, I'd only played three on three. I so in a way, it was kind of like it was soccer back then. I yeah. Mean, so you had a, yeah, oh my God. And so then you're taking women in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. They're playing full court basketball and had no clue. I mean, they were thrown in there because yeah. they wanted to play basketball. So they're playing full court basketball against men who were competitive to them. Yeah. And at one time in the seventies, I believe the book says they had three teams traveling the world, traveling this country to play. They'd been to Alaska, to Hawaii. They'd been on the Today Show. They'd been on. Well, that was the thing. Besides being competitive, which is the hardest thing, probably for everybody. I'm not. I'm not. The meaning at all, but men, women playing men at that time is not a heard of thing anyway. So, right. so that's hard in itself. Then traveling, then all things. 
Then you had to look pretty. Then you had oh. to do, you had to yes. do, there was contractual obligations. I'm reading yes. the book, I'm like, you know, it, it, it's crazy. You but, did not leave your room if you did not have red lipstick on, your hair done, and blue eyeshadow on. Period. Okay, now the, the, I, I read and I read the books, but you all had to dye your hair red. Yes, it took five bottles because my hair was dark brown. It took five bottles of to be red. To be red. Do yes. you ever want to be a redhead again? No. no that's <laughs> that's <just awkward. laughs> I've done it one time. We were having a reunion, and I've done it one time because we were playing a game. And I, I told my husband, I said, "Never again. I will never go back red." You know, because like. Our coach himself, the son, we had the son of the owner. He didn't really particularly look at your hair every day to make sure that it was not, your roots were not showing. He was a little lenient. But if we knew the owner was coming to town, buddy, we were hitting the Walmarts soon because our hair had better not have any of our roots showing at all. And you, when you went out onto the court, you had to have your makeup on. So you had no matter if it was practice. Yeah. No matter it was was basically the rule. The way the way I read it, and then both the books and everything else, the rule was you better be all dolled up at all times and looking and representing this team. And that's a great honor to have, and it's a great opportunity. But at the same time, no idea how hot it is in Arizona at the Grand Canyon and having to wear that warm up jacket. Yeah. Uh, It was miserably hot but we couldn't leave without having our our we had to be in dress clothes with our warm-up jacket on we were just at all times at no all matter times. what yeah because you were a lady and you were to present yourself as a lady and you know and i know barry was telling you earlier when we did stay in hotels we left that hotel lot we found it because we were a lady you didn't destroy it and if anything got broken or tore up they, it was well, that was what's crazy because I, I played in arena <laughs> ball and I played in you know college and everything else. We never paid attention to the rooms. We you guys made your beds before you left. <laughs> yes. You guys like you guys were cleaning up. Not only were you practicing five hours before the game, having half half of the game done, then doing trick shots and entertaining the crowd during halftime, playing the rest of the game, beating the hell out of the men, <laughs> but then going home and making the damn beds before you leave. <laughs> Everything else, and then but you but you can't go get ice unless you have your makeup done and everything else. I mean, if we were already back at the hotel after we'd played, you might run down to the ice machine to get ice. But you you had better look your best if you were going out to in the public because he wanted you were representing him. You were representing yeah. the redheads, and that's the way it even should be today. If you are, to me, I think if you are playing on a team. And you are wearing that team's school logo. You need to be representing that logo. You don't need to be out there being a thug. Yeah. I, I just don't think you should be. And I think that goes back to that's how I was taught. You need to respect the school that you are playing for. Because now they, those kids are getting paid to go. Yeah. I mean, they're getting paid well. Yeah. And I know that because even when our son was just an equipment manager, he got free shoes. He got free clothes. He got free food. He got everything. Well, it's it's, it's very easily dismissed because that's yeah. expected now. Because of people like you made it to where it is now. Because even when I was in college, you know, it, it wasn't like we didn't have to make our beds. We didn't have anything else. Right. But I was still in that generation. I was in that generation of Woody Hayes. That yeah. hard, those hard, because you have, but you need that. Yeah. Like now, now today, everybody's got to worry about their feelings. What, how they're gonna feel? Well, get that. You know, if did you're you, on my you team and you were somebody, yeah, you like get off my. Like I didn't want those because that's my coach is Jerry Harris. You know, Coach Johnny, who's one of the winningest coaches in the nation, or the winningest coach in football coach in the nation. Man, they don't put up with no shit. Now, my high school basketball coach. I mean, literally, that man would throw chairs. He just and you the Bobby not, Knight effect, baby. You, you the Bobby Knight. And I, I love Coach Danny Dunnigan to death, and I think a lot of him. And I've taken him the books, and and I respected him. He gave me that opportunity to play. He, yeah. You know, I, yes, I tried out. He trained me. He made me in my ninth grade year at high school. He was he started as a coach, and we went undefeated, twenty five and zero. So. You take a high school coach that can do that to a new team that he's coming in to coach, that tells you something about his coaching style. 
He had a desire to coach the us girls, and he went with it. Well, here's the thing. Besides just the desire to coach, you all have the desire to, to play. win, to yes. play, to yeah. win, to play. Because you can't have that. Nowadays, It's and I'm not saying with every team, but you, you look like a Nick Saban. Those boys will die for that. <laughs> yes. Now, does Nick get in your ass? Hell yes. yeah. Because I, cause you can, I always tell my, my buddy that I talked about earlier, Chris Booker, I was like, you know, me and Booker are talking about the Bama game, and I'd be like, yeah, what's the score at halftime? He's like, man, it was 10 to 13. Bama was down. Yeah. I was like, what happened after halftime? Because Nick got in that ass and said, look, boys. He's like, this is the way it is. And I could see a little emotion when you were talking about your coach from, you know, from yeah, high school. Yeah. He would tell us, I could go down to the nursing home and get grandmas to play basketball mm-hmm. there than you. It was not a, it, and like if we, for one instance, we, there was a group of them got on an FBLA trip, got into some trouble. Well, the next day when you got back, you hit the bleachers. And when I'm talking about running, you ran up them, you ran across them, you ran down them, across, back up. 30 times. And he would tell us, you're running line drills till you puke. And you just started praying that somebody would start puking. Yeah. You know, please, somebody just stop and puke. Just stop and puke. <laughs> Fake so it. Stop. Because yeah. he didn't stop. He well, did let not me, stop. Let me ask you, like, as far as that goes, you know, I know what my coaches that were like, like that. Because like I said... You're a little bit older than me, not too much, because I'm, I'm very young. I'm very young, so that, there you go. But, uh, <laughs> I'm very young, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you, you know, I, I, I came in that, at the end of Woody Hayes, and that was still a little bit there, but that's who made me me. Uh, yeah. You know, and that had it, that, yeah. That. And he made you be able to be on these teams yes. and take elbows and, and go through some adversity, in the, doing the trick shots and winning the men's games, you know, doing all this stuff and having to do this and just going, this is part of what I bought into. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. And we, and we loved it. And the thing that we kept in our mind was we are doing this because we love to play basketball. There's a pride. There was a pride oh, yeah. to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to tell you, I'm very competitive. Very competitive. There is no man going to outdo me if I can help it. Nobody sees him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but her husband's in the corner going, gee, he just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's playing, with his, he's playing Top Gun or something. But. <laughs> Ask her how we found out she was pregnant. Yeah, I mean, we uh, we got married in 93. 90, yeah, 93. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you about the story of our us mating. So I worked with his brother and sister-in-law at the time at the hospital. And he was coming back from Desert Storm, and he'd been divorced for four or five years, and he was coming home, and Keith said, hey, will you go out with him? I'm like, sure, fine. Went out with him. I left that date. That man did not know my last name, nor did he have my phone number. And I looked at my sister-in-law, or my ex-sister-in-law now, and I said, if you give him my number, I promise you I will hurt you. It is that bad? <laughs> bury, bury. So, <laughs> what? What, yeah. what movie do you take her to? <laughs> oh, a little bit pompous. You yeah, didn't know her. Well, yeah. she's, a, she's a, You didn't know who you were talking to yet. Not because he didn't have a clue anything about me. I mean, he didn't know about the redheads till we'd been married a couple of years. So anyway, uh, two or three weeks had went by, and she's like, can I give him your, your number? And I said, no. I will hurt you, Shauna. You will never nurse again. I will hurt you if you give him the number. He called me that night. He called, and my baby brother answered the phone, and he said, uh, thank you for calling the HIV AIDS hotline. How can we help you? Oh, I was just giving him. So, very hung up the phone. He calls back. My brother answers again. He said, thank you for calling the HIV AIDS hotline. How can we help you? And he said, can I speak to Michelle? And I said, I will kill you, Teddy, if you give him the phone. If you give me the phone, yeah, here, because he knew then it was going to be a fight before me and him. Yeah, was, and we were always looking to fight with one another. And I told so him, your brother's pulling some crap on yeah. you, but <laughs> here you go. Yeah. <laughs> and so he said, "Hey, will you go out with me?" And I'm like, "Okay, fine." And so he came to the house on a Friday night. On Saturday. Was his ego town down in this no, time? He no. No. Oh, don't don't ever take it away, Barry. He was in the house and, and like my brother. Mm, what's up? Yeah. Little poke high. Well, he had that <laughs> chest sticking out. He had his pinrobe Pe- jeans. He had yes. peg pants. He had peg pants. He had those jeans pinrobed <laughs> and rolled up. And so my sister stood there and he walks in with that chest bowed out. And he says, my dad looks at him and says, do you hunt? Yep. 
My dad just welcomed him to the table, and I'm like, really, dad? Why That's it. Well, <laughs> I would have been welcome this? to the table. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my dad tells my mom, he said, if he comes back three times, that she'll marry him. And I said, he won't get the opportunity to come back three times. Well, damn it, he came back three times. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, like six months into us dating, he offered me an engagement ring. And I said, you're going to need to put that in your pocket. He's like, you're not going to take it? And I said, no. He's like, are you serious? I said, I'm not taking that ring. You're going to need to keep it in your pocket. And he's like, when are you going to take it? And I said, when I get ready. Uh, so about... Did there was no, there's no, there's no <laughs> nut kicking you, Barry. You're just taking it. Just hi, man. Just <laughs> so, uh, you didn't even know if she liked you for six months. You're like, man, this is the one for me. I, I, I like abuse, man. I even took her to a Richard Marks concert. Yeah, I mean, oh, he did, he did hold everything. on to the night. He did everything he could possibly do to try to get me to take that ring, and I'm like, no. Mm. Uh, in January, he had said, he'd, I'd had an apartment at Jonesboro, and he stayed all night, and he said, you want to go get married? And I said, sure. His grandmother died. <laughs> that, that morning. <laughs> that morning. We got the call, his grandmother died, and I we said. We getting up, getting ready to go to the JP. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I said, uh, no, we're not getting married. And he's like. Not today, I, you know. I said, no, we're not getting married. I said, I said, I know. I, uh, No. If your grandmother dies the day you ask me to get up and go get married, no, we ain't getting married. And he's like, Can I ask a question? Just a side <laughs> note for me, because this is a funny story to me. How many times about did he ask you to marry him? Three or, three. three or four times. Three or four yeah. times. And so he said, he said to me, he said, we're never getting married. And I said, your grandmother died on the day you asked me to get up and go get married. No, we're not getting married. Sorry. But Barry, I'm gonna stick up for you in this one because you had already asked her four, three times, maybe four. You know. So anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. So anyway, then March rolls around and he's like, uh, March the fifth. We had started dating March the seventh the year before. On March the fifth, he said, um, "I think we should go get married today." And I said, "Okay, if nobody dies, we'll go get married." <laughs> <laughs> So I said, but here's the stipulations. We have to get married in a church. And he's like, what? I said, we have to get married in a church. He's like, okay. So we went to Caraway, where I was from, and the pastor at the, at the church that I was going to at the time, he married us there in his office. And he looked at Barry and he said, do you want to be right or do you want to be wrong? And Barry said, I want to be no, right. actually it was, <laughs> do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? happy? And I said, I like being happy. I ain't been right since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm still married. not, man. I'm still, we got that's mine. On March of fifth in '93, and um, it was probably well. I I had gotten a bad UTI. I went to the doctor and told him. I said, "Now I'm on birth control." He said, "It's not going to hurt you." He said, "Your antibiotics are not going to hurt you." Uh, probably about seven months later, eight months, Barry came home and he was throwing up. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Oh, I, I just don't feel good. What do you mean you don't feel good? He said, I've been sick all morning. And so... Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Oh, on a second. Man, I know where this is going. Yes, it gets The better. man's puking. Yes, thank the you. The man's a berry. Yes. Man, no, it's that you're not right. You're not right. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't know. So, she done hexed your ass, man. <laughs> well, you got to know my mom. <laughs> he was scared of my mother. <laughs> so, about... Two or three months later, I told him, I said, well, I've got to go get my birth control renewed. And he's like, okay. So I went into the doctor, and he was sitting out in the waiting room, and the doctor walked in. He said, did you forget to tell me something? And I was like, no, why? Uh. Because, I mean, I was serious. We had lost a child. We'd, we'd gotten pregnant. We'd lost a child. And so I said, no. And he's like, okay. He said, well, I'm going to need you to get me a urine sample. And he said, I looked at the nurse. He said, will you go get Mr. Wire and bring him in? So Barry comes back thinking something's wrong. Well, I'm thinking something's wrong. Yeah. So he walks in and he says, well, I don't know whether to say congratulations or uh, to give you my condolences. And Barry's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, she's pregnant. And I'm like, I'm going to kill you. He's like, I was just, well, what did you tell me? I was just, I was poking fun yeah, I was just serious. poking fun. You took me serious. <laughs> I said, that would be but your the, last the, time. The downside to this, the, and one of the reasons I said no so fast is just, about a month before this, when we get mad at each other instead of fighting and arguing, we go play basketball. I didn't know she played semi-pro ball. <laughs> I played a little ball in the Army. 
And he was yeah. going to take me down. You see yeah, 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 yeah. He's going to put gonna us gonna in. We'd be mad at each other. We'd be ball checking each other in the gut. And, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, a month later, we'd find out she's pregnant. I'm like, no. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, because you know what you've been doing, dude. That's a... He played me just as hard as the men that I've played against. But he didn't know that. I mean, you know, because that was just... That's how you guys, but then that's yeah. a good, that's a good, that's actually kind of a cool, like, side note love story to me is like, okay, we ain't gonna argue about this shit. Let's get on the court, Mom. Oh, yeah. We Let's would go. walk down to the basketball court mm-hmm. and say, buddy, we. After that, we just start fighting. I could drop him to his knees. I mean, no time. I could drop, and he's just like, why do you play like that? I said, that's how I was taught. Yeah. He was like, you ain't gotta be so rough. I said, oh, yeah, I do. And then because she I make the mistake and said, well, you don't have to be such a wimp. <laughs> yeah, so step it up, baby. I'm an Iraqi vet, man. What are you gonna do, man? And then, I started dropping back and hitting threes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that's how you know that was just how we played. And what I mean, I him and I have played several times since then, and I've kind of kept back and didn't hurt him so bad. So, but uh, you know, knees hurt well, a little yeah. bit. Then well, I, that kind of goes into. One another different story about you, and the reason you're in the occasions, Jones World's occasions, magazines, and everything, and uh, the story of your son, yes, Barry uh, Wire Jr. And um, you know, I, I don't even know, like I, I we didn't get to talk about this before, and I really, I kept I kept telling people, don't tell them. I said I don't want I don't want to hear. I want my actual response. I kind of know, but I didn't know. I mean, you've talked about it at the gym and everything yeah. else and everything else. And, and the questions yeah, that... I, I, yeah, I go ahead. That? Absolutely. I, I want to thank... And Jess is not here and Taylor's not here. I want to thank both of them so much because they have helped me tremendously through my weight loss journey. I mean, they have pushed me to new, to new levels that I never thought that I'd ever be able to do. To be able to run on a treadmill now at 51 years old, I'm not afraid to say I'm half 100. To be able to do that... With what I had been through in life, I never thought that I would be able to do that. And I'm so thankful for Jessica and Taylor both for helping me through that journey. During the beginning of that, when this was all going on with through this point, you show you showed me pictures, you brought me posters and everything else, which thank you very much. It's they're awesome. Like I, I, I hated ignoring you guys talking, but I was trying to read just for this. And and yes, Jessica and Taylor are both amazing women. They're yes, both. And they that's are. Jessica's the one that got this. And I didn't do. I I, I kind of skipped over because I'll save her to later. But she's the one that put the most work into this studio. She's the one that put she's the most. She's a hard work. working woman. She's Love but it's her it, it's, it's heartfelt. It's yes, not it's it not is. fake. It, you know because here's the thing on my aspect about the person you're talking about about Jessica Hollis. When you from my perspective, I've seen the devil, man. I played with the devil. I've I, lived with the devil. Yeah, man. Right. <laughs> you know, and and that's true though. We've seen we've well, seen yeah, the upset. Seen. When you when you travel across the you see what bad, corrupt, awful yeah. people yeah. turn into, and then you see somebody like Jessica and you're like, that nah, you're faking bullshit. Bullshit. Like I didn't believe her for the first two years I met her. I'm like, nah, nah, there's something else to this. Yes. You know, because So it's, I had um I had weight loss surgery in December 2017. I'm down 112 pounds. Uh, life changing. But yeah. I knew it was going to be. But let me back up to how this all transpired. Bringing in my son. Yeah. Let's go back to that. So what is your question? Okay, well, we really hear. Okay, so uh, and we're gonna we're gonna showcase this. But the reason you're in occasions. Is there's a 5K tomorrow morning? There is, yes. yes. It's a 5K. It starts at Brooklyn High School. Uh, starts at eight o'clock. If you've not registered, you can register the day of the race. It is in memory of our son. We lost our son June the second, two thousand and fourteen. Uh, devastated. Yeah. Hope I can get through this. But. Um, I wanted to die. My child had died. I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't have a desire to. So in my mind, I could kill myself. I didn't have the heart to kill myself with a gun or anything like that or drugs. I thought, I can eat myself to death. So that was my mission, that I would eat myself till I'd die of a heart attack or have a stroke. That did not happen. 
uh, November 2015, my oldest son and his wife have never been able to have children. We're given the opportunity to take two foster kids in. A brother and sister who had never lived together, but they were biologically brother and sister. They never lived in the same foster home together. Um, Barry and I took them to the zoo. I was 330 pounds, and I could not make it through the entire zoo. And I told Barry, I said, I've got to do something. He's like, what do you want to do? I began looking into it. Had a gastric sleeve done December the 11th. My highest weight was 330 pounds. Um, but you did almost die before that. I did. I did. I uh, got severely depressed. That's about your pneumonia. And uh, had a, just, depression will eat you alive. The devil will get inside your head and play mind games with you. He just will not stop because he's give, been given that opportunity. There's no, there's no, there's, and I, I hate to break this, but I'm a father, and and I wasn't a father till I was 35 years old, and there's nothing worse. I wake up every day, and I don't, I don't mean to put anything into you guys. No, or no, no, no. Parents, but I wake up every day, and I worry every yes. freaking day. Please make sure he's okay because he's yeah. not around me. Please don't let anything. I, and it's it's weird. You know, one understands that. You know, when people say, "Oh, when you have kids, it's different." No, motherfucker, it, it is different. It is different. And for you to experience what you experienced by losing your child in two thousand June second, two thousand fourteen. Yes. Okay. For either of you, that's hell on earth. To me, yes. that's hell on earth. That you you are not to me as a person. There's no but nothing you can you can do we whatever you want. We are not supposed to bury our children. Yeah, and Th you that's can't not hurt. How life is supposed to be. You're supposed to be a parent, a grandparent, and you're supposed to die before your kids. Well, unfortunately, that's not always God's plan for us. Yeah. You know, He is He controls everything, and so um, backing up to 2013, we were in Maine. I I worked as a dialysis nurse. I did travel nursing. I'd been to Pennsylvania. In 2012, after Barry and I graduated, Barry joined me in Pennsylvania uh, up in Quidditch Job. Barry was making $100,000 plus and he quit his job. I started saying, what are we going to do? He's like, we're not going to worry about it. We're going to walk. God's going to take care of us. And I'm like, we've lived a lifestyle of $100,000 plus dollars. And you're telling me now that we're going to live off your $3,000 a month VA? He's like, yes, we are. Holy crap, who does that? And he just began, and I just began to turn into the Lord. And I, I was like, okay. Can I, can I stop? Yeah. Just, okay, what was the reason for that? Do you just wanted to live, but you just wanted to be with her? No, the reason for that was because. Because it's 2013. 2012. Right? 2012. 2012. So two so years before away. Barry Jr. That's when I started. I didn't walk away he, in 2013. Okay. He, I began, he was not doing things with the family. He he. All oh, about work. All about the job. He was so was consumed money. with money and work. In order to have money, you had to work because he sold cars. He was so consumed with money, he didn't have time for family vacations. He was never at home when the kids had things going on at school. Never. He just never was at home. And I told him, I said, "This is what's happening. Barry Downs fits in to graduate high school, and I'm gonna I'm gonna leave him." Because okay. never. Because well, we, just before I even said this. <laughs> I had that with Tracy Smith. I asked him to live on his property and be in the back. Be just put me away. I just want to be away from society, away from I lived in a camper for two years because I just I you feel that demon. It's a creep, man. Yeah. It's on uh, you. And you felt it. That. You. I got so yeah. I got so consumed with money and power because you know when you're number one at a place like Fletcher. You know, that's a big lot. That's a swag, man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You yeah. get to you get to be you get to be the man. Yeah. And I was every place I'd worked at, I was number one at one time or another. I was making the change, but it was taking her. Either you're going to go on vacation with us for a week, or you're going to have divorce papers when I get back. So I would go on vacation. Then the whole vacation I spent sticking around trying my phone. When she'd take a nap or something, anything going on, what's going on? <coughs> and then we'd fight the whole vacation because 
So it well, you it consumes you. Exactly. It's, it's, it it's not it's not like you didn't realize it, but at the same time. Here's a woman you asked to marry you five, ten times, because I doubt it's four, yeah. you know, and, and then you have Barry Jr., and, and that's what you wanted, and you lose those things because of consumption of money. I need these things, because that's if I can provide, material. yeah, I can, if, I, if I can give my wife a good car and give them all these things, I, I'm the man, yeah. and it has nothing to do with that shit. No. And all she wanted was my heart. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, uh, when I in 2012, when she said she was going to start travel nursing, I told I had started working my way slowly back into church and stuff. And I said, Lord, I said, if you want me out of this business, you get me out. Whatever you do, from May of 2012 till May of 2013, I was the most miserable car salesman in Northeast Arkansas. I went from selling 30 cars a month. Barely selling 10. It was costing me to drive from Perryville to Jonesboro to work some weeks. Some weeks I was barely covering the bills. So when 2013, the VA sent me an increase in my pay that we could live off of, I quit and I went to Pennsylvania where she was. He came to Pennsylvania with me and um, we were there. We li literally lived in Amish country. We never. No, I know where you're at. Yeah, That's a, see, never, I'm in Ohio. I know exactly. Exactly. Where <laughs> we did not open Walmart's door, and I was there for 13 <laughs> weeks. <laughs> loved it. Dude, how many loved How many buggies were you behind? Oh, I loved it. We yeah. would go looking for them. We, oh, they're great people. They're awesome people. We did, we did, all, we did all our shopping at the with the Amish. We got fresh cow's milk. We got fresh produce. We got butter was a mess. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. I, I make my own butter now. Mm. I'll have to make you some. I make fresh butter. They taught me how to make fresh butter. The Amish. I yeah. love it. I love so it. So anyway, he did come with me. And then in, uh, May, in uh, July, August. August of 2014, I was given the opportunity to go to Portland, Maine. Love Maine. Absolutely love it. Been there twice. Um, What's your favorite place about Maine? What's your favorite thing? Because I've been there. The fresh seafood, right? Yes. I love, oh. My first stint there, I was by myself. Uh, I was right. I had a cottage home right on the ocean. I could watch the ships come in with the fresh lobsters, all of that, right out my back door. Had wildlife all out my back door. Absolutely loved it. And I had told Barry, I said, it's if I green get the chance, too, just yes. green, beautiful. Oh. I told Barry, I said, if we get the opportunity, I want you to go back to Maine with me. Well, I did. A position opened up for uh, 16 weeks in Portland, Maine. South Portland, we went. Uh, in November, we were there, and I had gotten up that morning, and it's funny how God will just kind of let you know something's not right. Once you become, once you allow God to take control of your life, He lets you know when things are out of spot. That morning, we'd gotten up, and it was my day off. We were supposed to go do grocery shopping, just well, do what we wanted to do. And he said, well, we'll go to the grocery store. And I said, no, I don't want to. He's like, what's going on? I said, I just don't want to go. I had laid down. And Barry came in there, and he's like, Barry Don's on the phone. And I said, what's wrong? And he's like, well, actually, he's in the doctor's office. And I was like, so I got on the phone, and the doctor got on the phone with me. And she said, hey. She said, Barry came in, and he's rectally bleeding. He needs to get to the surgeon. I like, what's wrong with him? She said, I'm not sure. She said, but he's he's bleeding. He's actively bleeding. He needs to get to the surgeon. Um, made a few phone calls, got a hold of ASU, and they told me, said, I told him, I said, we're packing, we're coming home, got a hold of my recruiter. Um, and I told Barry, I said, we have to drive straight home. And the coaches said, we're going to stay with him. We'll do whatever we got to do for him. You get home safe. Was this 24, 20? 20... 27 hours yeah. is what we drove. That's a, that's a, that's yeah. a, yeah. So we... Neither, okay, so we'd been up since about 7 o'clock that morning. So we had packed. And this, like I said, it was around noon time. So we, we got packed, packed in 30 minutes. Yeah, packed yeah. everything up, everything we'd taken. Because when you travel nurse, you have to take clothes for winter, summer, wherever you're going to be at. So And you've got a couple. So here we were packing everything up. We get on the road. We literally drive 27 hours to get home. And um, a 65-pound boxer. Yeah. So we'd driven 27 hours. And neither one of us had had any sleep. Uh, only stopped to grab a bite to eat, gas in the vehicle, and hit the road. Um, got home, got in to check on him. He was doing okay. The bleeding had stopped. They discovered he had Crohn's. 
And so Barry's like, well, what are we going to do? Are you going to take another position? I said, no, I think I'm just going to stay local right now until, because he had to learn how to eat. So, okay, can you, do, can, uh, don't mean to pause here, no. okay? And I know this is difficult. Uh, explain to people that don't know about Crohn's what Crohn's is. Crohn's is a, um, it messes your digestive system. So you really have to watch what you eat. It, you will, you might could eat a tomato and start bleeding. It just, your inside, your stomach, it just starts eating away at it. The acids, the everything acid, else goes left, acidic, right, acidic, every, yeah. Will just start frying your stomach. Uh, so I told him, I said, we, we've got to help. I need to help him learn what to eat, when to, you know, how to do that. Because he didn't want to be labeled as Crohn's and be on medicine the rest of his life. Because he had severe ADHD. I mean, to the point that he was in trouble all the time in school. And fought us tooth and nail with medicines. He would, he would put it under his tongue, wouldn't take it. He'd get to school. All hell would break loose. So he told us, he said, if you just don't make me take it, I'll learn the diet. And he did. Learned it to a T. But I just began to pray. I said, God, you know, just, I just want to stay local. I want to stay home for a while. We had sold our four-bedroom, two-bath house in Paragool. We had gotten a, got him. We actually got him an apartment here in Brooklyn at the Whitten Creek Apartments. And that's where he, he had all of our furniture. So we were literally just like, come in, stay a couple of weeks, go back out on the road. Mm-hmm. So he was batching it at 18 and he loved it. He would, the house never was dirty. He, he kept things organized. He was just this kid that Barry and I could give him our credit card and we could travel across the country. I never had to worry about what he might have bought. <laughs> I've been balling. <laughs> Let's go. Matter of fact, he would call and say, is it okay if I go to the grocery store and spend $100? Oh, I've been balling. And yeah. so he, we were literally on the beach with a couple of friends of ours in Maine. And he called and he said, hey, he said, uh, I'm going to go to Iggy. That was his best friend in college that worked with him. He said, I'm going to go to Iggy's house. And Barry's like, we're... A thousand miles away, why are you calling me? I just need you to know where I'm going to be. That's just the type of kid he was. He was just very respectful. Not that my other kids were not, but they were just, there was just something different about him. And I love all of my kids equally. But you could just tell, he, that, well, let me just tell you how he was. He uh, had gotten scholarship money. And it was in between me working and like I said, Barry had quit by then. And he brought money in. And he said, here, he said, take this money and go buy groceries with it. And I said, well, that's your scholarship money. And he said, it's just extra cash I have left over. Take it and go buy groceries. That's kind of unheard of. Well, it's an 18 year old yeah. kid. That's what I said. I, even me, I would have been like, Paul, <laughs> buy me whatever. <laughs> and it wasn't just a little money. I mean, it was like six or $700. And so that was just how he was. And so then I had gotten a full-time position at NEA Dialysis working. And uh, working full-time. He would come by there on his way to ASU, stop and bring me breakfast. He would come by. And never- well, which is one of the, uh, I'm sorry, that, that no, reminds me. One of the cool parts about the, the Occasion magazine that I was reading the article is every time before the game, he'd come yeah. out and give you a hug and yeah. kiss, and he'd come and talk to his parents yeah. and everything else. Yes, always. Yeah, and that's, that that don't really, because I ain't that. I wasn't that. What a, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I want to say it really truthful. What a douchebag I am for not being that to my mom. My mom and my grandma were, were the best people in the world, and I just, I had to you be know, that tough guy. And Mary said the same thing. He said, I didn't treat my mother with the respect God, he did you. you don't. That was something that he did. He respected me. Now, I will say this. We were in Mobile, Alabama that same year, January of that year, and he he always kind of worked the opposing side with the team. And he was over there, and he'd come up. Here he come, half time. Hey, Mom, how are you? Give me a hug and kiss. And he dropped the elf bomb in front of me. There was 20,000 people in the stands, and I looked at him, and I backhand him in the mouth. Oh, hell. There was a lady sitting in front of me. Mm-hmm, that's exactly that's what he needed. <laughs> he looked at me, and he said, Willie, Mom, in front of everybody? I said, you know how I feel. And he said, I don't have to take that. And I said, you're right, you don't. He got down to the end of the bleakers, and he said, I love you, Mom. Oh, he said, 
<laughs> oh, <I> screwed up. <laughs> so anyway, the game finished. And I had went out. Of course, the fans, we had won, and we'd all went out on the field. And he looked at Barry, and he ran up to Barry and gave, gave him a chest bump. And he said, where's mom? And Barry's like, seriously? She slapped you, and you want to know where your mom's at? But he did respect me. And he, you know, and Barry said, well, he didn't respect me that way. No, he didn't, because he, you were not always there. And I'm not taking nothing away from Barry, but children, I, I've stressed to you. We've and talked I about it, I am yeah. just amazed at how well that you interact with your son and you're it's always about talent and i love that about you because you show the world that that is what he what your life is about well it's to me and and i know we're going off a tangent here but and i learned this you know a lot of times when 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 i was growing up people were like just do it don't explain it just do it you listen to no, me and you're going to talk, homie. Yeah. Me and you're going to talk. So, okay, why are you bad? What's up? What's up? Why are you upset? You know, I talk to him and, and like, I'm different. I get it. I'm from the North. We cuss. We do different things and everything else. But he, he understands one thing. Daddy's an entertainer. Daddy's this fighter. Daddy's done these things. In the North, they talk like that. <laughs> they did, Where daddy's from, they talk like that. But I've explained to him, I said, we don't talk like that here. Right. You're, you're, this is where you're from. This is what they expect from you here. You don't talk like that. But the point is, the conversations you have with your children, people don't have their conversations. When I wake up in the morning, I ain't worried about my phone going, ha, ha, ha. But it, like most, and I'm not saying like most, I don't mean to generalize or anything else, but I have a, com- what do you want to do, man? What are we doing today, yeah. brother? You know, uh, Barry and Barry Don got really close the last couple of years because Barry did spend more time. Barry, may, Barry took him to concerts. Barry started taking him to concerts when he was young. There were a couple concerts that he was very angry with me about because he got grounded and I would not let him go after he had the tickets. But I had to you teach him. You ain't mess with mama. Right. That's <laughs> hey. not, you know, he very, very <laughs> showed all the kids. He said, let me tell you, you can make me mad, she will protect you. Mm-hmm. You make her mad, I cannot protect you. And Can't so do nothing. It was just, I wanted the, my kids taught to respect people. And he did. He respected people period so we're leading on down the track and here comes it's june second uh barry and i had been to church and we had just at that point in time we live for the lord and we still do uh he is our main focus in the morning barry gets up he studies his bible in the morning i get up i have my devotional time that morning i'd gotten up it was 4 30 Barry Don had taken my car the night before. He said he was going to stay all night with a friend, Michael. And I said, yeah. He's Because Barry was going to take his the next day and get some stuff done to it. And I said, Dad will take me to work in the morning. So we got up and KIT had put in an alert. A crash on Brown Chapel Road with a fatality. I looked at Barry and I said, I don't know who it is, but somebody has been killed. Just pray for him. Not knowing we were praying for ourselves. Uh, Barry got the call about 9 30 10 and uh, he called my boss and he said I need you to get Michelle off the clinic floor and he said Barry Don's been killed Um, so she first calls out to the clinic and she talks to the nurse over me and she tells her she tells Megan she said uh, or Gina she says Gina she said come I need to talk to you. So Gina goes back there and talks to her. Well, when Gina comes out, I said something to Gina, but she turned her head. She would not look at me. And I thought, that's odd. So I just went on about my business, and a few minutes later, Maury came out to the floor, and she said, Michelle, can I talk to you a minute? I said, sure. So I'm thinking, I'm in trouble. Yes, I, I did some Why uh, else would my boss be calling me out to the floor? So she, we go out the door, and she says, just have a seat in the break room. I'll be right back. And I'm thinking, holy crap. And I look up, and Barry walks in the door. Barry and Maury both. And he said, Barry not was killed this morning. I just went to the floor. I, I I, How else do you say? How else do you say? I There's just nothing. literally went to the floor. Uh, we go out the back way. Um, my oldest son and his wife is back there with Barry. They'd driven Barry up to the clinic. And um, we got to Paragol. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to see him. I couldn't. The last time I seen my child was Sunday night before he left the house. And before he left, 
first of all, Friday night, he was leaving to go to work in Jonesboro, and I said, be careful, it's raining. And he said, Mom, why do you worry? I said, that's a mom's job. He said, if I die tonight, I'm going to heaven. I have nothing to worry about. I said, okay. Well, Sunday night, he got ready to leave, and he said, uh, I love you, Mom. See you later. I'll see you later. He never said, I'll see you later. He always said, I'll see you tomorrow. He said, I will see you later. And I said, okay. And he had the biggest smile on his face. So we get to Paragol. And uh, I said, can I go see him? And the coroner says, no. And I said, what do you mean, no? I said, that's my child. He said, I cannot let you see your child. And I said, why? How do you know it's him? He said, I have his driver's license. I said, then why can't I see him? And he knelt down in front of me and he said, he's been damaged too bad. And I said, I need to know what? He said, I can't tell you. And a nurse. And a nurse <laughs> that I knew for years, she said, Michelle, I know it's very dumb. I, she grew, we, we went to church with her when he was little. She said, it's him. And I said, I have to see my child. She said, we can't. I was the only mother out of four people that did not get to see their child. All the rest of them got to see their children. I was so mad. I was like, seriously, God, I have followed you. I have done what you've asked me to do. Why would you keep him from me? Why? He said, that's not what's important. You know your child's in heaven. Those other mothers do not. Literally, Mike, they did not know where their child is spending eternity. Holy. I know where my child's spending eternity. What the? Like. I have a mother that tells me every year, you know where Barry Don is. She said, I don't know where. And his name is Michael. She said, I don't know where Michael is. She said, and that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. Literally breaks my heart. Because the last thing you want to know is that you don't know if your child is burning up in hell or if they have a life of luxury in heaven. Well, I know without a doubt. And so God told me, he said, I've allowed you to know that. He told you that Friday before he was killed. He said he told you on Friday he was never coming home. But you didn't listen to him. But God had started preparing us for this. And so we just, there was just things. Yeah, you put the things together. Like yes, you've already said. But, the, it, but we didn't put it together at that time because you're trying to not. wrap your mind around it. No, it's just, it's small little, yes, it's small it's little, just, small little Legos that make something yes, big. Exactly. Exactly. So anyway, um, he died that Monday. Um uh, so Wendy. can can and I'm sorry. No, no, go okay, ahead. Any here's, questions? Well, I'm, like I can't. That's f- freaking awful. I'm trying to be PC to to know what happened. Is there something about the wreck you want to know? No, anything. No, mean, anything. like I want to know your like your your thoughts. Neither one of you There's seen no it. PC waiting. Well, no, 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 no. But that, that's the thing. But yeah. But we are. We but you are, took acceptance. You took something out of it. Because there's no way in hell. There's no like I am such a it's such a uh, such a, my, a bad is, person. No, you're not. Or like, because no. I would I would have tipped things over. I would have killed people. Oh, well, there, there, uh, I know you would have, but so you know. We, so <laughs> Monday comes and we are like, ah. we are like bombarded with people because he was. We didn't realize the impact he had at ASU. Yeah. We didn't have a clue that he impacted people. He obviously. He did not meet a stranger. He went into the world. Everything he told everybody, and it, and you'll notice, you'll notice on our race badge, everything that we have with his name or anything attached, it says "Smile, God's on your side." That's what he. Yeah, it's in the. It's a, yes. Yeah, that's what he says. That's yeah. what he told people every day. Hold your head up. Do not let them see you get down. Because when you see, let them see you get down, then they've defeated you. Hold your head up. Smile, God's on your Smile, side. God's on your side. He told, and we did not realize that's what he told people. That's what people were coming to us and telling us. And we're just like, and he, really? what the, you're like, yes. like I don't want to hear this. And like, people were telling us, <laughs> yeah. you know, he was so well-mannered. He was this, this. And I'm like, do y'all know the same person that we do? Because at home, he didn't always behave like that. 
I mean, because he, of, yeah, he was, of course, he was a teenager, yeah. you know. So anyway, Tuesday morning rolls. Well, Barry and I go to bed that night, and so we're just thinking if people just leave the house, we just need to be. We need to try to process it. A break. So away. Give us, give us some time. And the who they are, they're not going to leave you alone. You know, when you have that many siblings. Uh, by the time we got back from Paragool, my house was full of people. All of my siblings, minus three, were there. All of my siblings. Well, that's a house full and I'm an apartment. Not counting our church family? No, yeah. And, and so our, we... Our senior uh, class. Oh, yeah. My senior class, my entire senior class just about showed up. So here we are. People left and my one of my sisters... I but say, can I just say something real quick? Yeah. Because during that, and it, like, and I understand that because, like, you know what? I'm a very much alone person, and and nobody. It's very hard to get. To, I don't want to talk to people. I don't, even when bad, good things are going, when I'm when I'm when I'm doing the greatest thing in the world, just leave me alone. Man. Yeah. I, I don't want to talk about. It. Is it, can what I'm trying to ask is, what sign was that to you? Because they, like, was there something there for that? Was that because you guys just wanted to be just ah? Oh, I just wanted well, rest. All the people. Yeah, for but all the people just kept coming and coming. Was that a, was that a? It was a. It was juggling. an outpour of love. Yeah. We were getting love from people that we didn't even know. My child knew them, but we didn't. But they loved him enough to come be respectful to us. Yeah, we had frat guys, football players. Oh yeah, I mean our house I mean, every night. No, this was a Monday on Tuesday. So Monday night we go to bed, and I look at Barry and I said. We're just still laying there. And I said, I'm just going to tell you, this will either, we either have to defeat this or it, it will end up, will we end up divorced? Because so many marriages, when you lose oh, a yeah. child, it's over with. Because the parents start blaming one another. Well, there was nobody to blame. Because you weren't there for this person when I needed right. you to do that. Right. Whatever it is. And whatever it is. So, him and I, we both just looked at one another and said, that's not going to happen. That's not an option. We only have each other now. Yeah. And we had children. Yes, we have other children, and, and we love them dearly. Michael's got two little boys. Stephanie has two. Or Michael has a boy and a girl. Stephanie has two little boys. We love our children and our grandchildren. It literally devastated our kids because there's such an age difference between them and Mary Dawn. Michael's 36. Stephanie's going to be 32. Two. So he They was, raised him, too. They did. They were raising you know, too, yeah. And, and him and Michael were close. They were very close. And and he would go by the high school. Stephanie teaches at Green County Tech, and he'd go by the school to see her. And so he was uh, he loved his siblings. He loved his family. And so um, that was not even an option for Barry and I to split or even to allow that to happen because to allow that to happen would be to blame his death on something that didn't have any control. And, and we what if it. We did. We what if it to death. What if we'd come home that day? Because we'd spent the day away all day, Barry and I did, just by ourselves. We had what if it to death. and Just bre- having having this, this moments, and I'm not, I'm not experiencing what you've experienced. You know a little bit about my situation. My son and I. And it's, you have those moments of just breaking down. You do. He's and gone. He, oh, What yes. could I, what, that what? That happened for me. Yeah. Um, uh, so, Tuesday morning, we get up, we make coffee, Barry and I sit down, and we, our appointment to be at the funeral home was 10 o'clock. We had everything written down. We had it all. We knew uh, exactly, by 7.30, we knew exactly what songs were being played, who was doing the flowers, who was doing the funeral. We had everything written. We get to the funeral home, and... Uh, I mean, I'd already called ASU, yes. made sure that the Paul Bears were the football players, that they had the jerseys. I'd already talked to Coach Anderson and Coach Trooper Taylor at the time, and Terry Mahajer. Everything was open for the football players that they needed. So we got to the funeral home, and you have, of course, there was four kids killed that morning. It yes. wasn't just our son. There was four kids killed. So you've got four families at this funeral home. Well, there's two there. The... Michael's mom and uh, Nathan's mom and families are there. And their appointment was like at 8 and 9 o'clock that morning. So I'm thinking 10 o'clock, we should be ready to roll and be done with it. Because in my mind, I knew my child was at that funeral home. So 
the longer we sat there, they were showing us caskets. Do you want this? And I said, it does not matter. It's, it's a closed, closed casket. casket. I don't care what you put in the damn inside of it. I don't care. I just want this done. We were there almost two hours because they had not finished their... And I was so mad. The longer I was there, and I talked about how the devil gets in your head, I kept hearing this little thing say, Mom, I'm just right back here. Come back here and see me. And I told Barry, I said, I need to get to the back. He said, you ain't going to the back. Well, so what, one of the guys walked by, and I said, hey, can you take me back there? I said, I've not seen him yet. Can you? And he's like, what? And I said, I've not seen my child yet. I'd like to see him. And he looked at Barry, and Barry's like, no, you can't go back there. He said, Michelle, we've discussed this. And I said, that is my child. They can't keep me from it. And he finally went and told me, he said, we've got to finish this because my wife is losing it. And I was. Yeah, of course. I, my... I was so mad because I'm right here. I'm within the walking distance to my child. I'm mad for you right now, and I'm not even the parents. So anyway, you know, it's like, what the hell? Again, God and the Holy Spirit is like, Michelle, he's with me. Why are you worried about it? Just don't think about it. He's with me. I'm like, fine, he's with you, but I want to know why I couldn't see him. You've allowed all these other mothers. Why can't I? And that's just how your mind plays games with you when you are going through something. And it's when you are going through those deep, dark valleys that your mind starts playing tricks on you. So we get through that, and um, Wednesday night was the visitation. Well, they first tried to talk to us and put him in a box. Oh, yeah. They wanted, to put, they wanted us to put him in a box. Not a casket, a box. And so Michael's sitting here. My son's name's Michael. And he's sitting here between Jeez. me and Barry. And he's like, well, this is the cost of the bots. I said, I don't want the damn bots. I don't care what it costs. I want this. This is what we're going to get. Okay. He mentions the bots again. And Michael finally says, if you mention we'll the bots one more, more time, time yeah. I'm fixing to knock you out. So the bots never was brought up again. So anyway, we get through they that. they to put him in the chapel. Uh, yeah, they wanted to put... Two of the kids were going into the chapel, and they were having a service together. Explain and they were, the chapel. I don't know The what that chapel is. at the funeral homes where they hold the funeral services. at the. It's like a church chapel. Okay, okay, I got okay. you, I got you. So they wanted to put Barry down in the chapel, and I was like, they said, well, he can be in there with the other kids. And I said, you don't understand. My family alone is going to fill up the room, you know, and that's like... So we get, so the next Wednesday night is the visitation. So we get through the, we go to the visitation. The family time was five to six, and then it was open to the public. It was supposed to close at eight o'clock. At 10 o'clock, I looked at Barry and I said, I have to go home. They were still wrapped around the building to come in to see Barry Donnie. There was, in his signature book, there was literally over a thousand signatures. And as we looked, as after the time went by and we were looking his memorial book, I told Barry, I said, did you remember seeing them? So there was people coming that we didn't even remember seeing. But I will tell you, I'd had Xanax by that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, no, so. here's the thing I want to stop because <laughs> there's, during this point, like, I've, I've got a little emotional. And, it'd be, and I, I'm, because I, I don't know what you felt, but I, I feel what you're talking. Cause that's, that's just awful. It's traumatic. It's, it's ridiculous. If what you hear in the box and hear the... Like my, I don't I for one, God is with you for yes. one because my Lord, I want to be home together. But at the same time, you're you're dealing with this. Did you feel like like, at the whole time that something was right there though? Like even though you're being pulled, someone was, was telling you like that it was okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's how the Holy Spirit works. When you, that's how the Holy Spirit you, you, works in you. Because I think that you got the Holy Spirit that will take care of the demons. Because the Holy Spirit starts intervening and then letting you know, no. And because like that Wednesday morning before the visitation, Barry had went to a counseling appointment because from the military, Barry has bad PTSD. So he he needed to go because okay, we've had this tragic death. And you're dealing with PTSD anyway, so you need to go to your counselor. And I said, go, I'm fine. So it was that quiet time that I had. Nobody mm. was there, just me. Because my family didn't know Barry had an appointment. Or they would have been there. Yeah. But I needed that time. And so during that time, I was like, God, I'm not going to get to see. He's like, really? You just want to see his face? You've got pictures. Look at the memories you've made. Look at the pictures you've taken. So I want to stress to everybody, pictures are amazing. Because when it's only a memory that you have, then you love those pictures. Yeah. Because this week, 
alone just this week, we were giving, and it's in the book, we were giving pictures that we'd never seen of our child. And to have that. No. Oh my God, it's a new memory. That's yes, like, it's oh, like, dude. It's like, oh my God, thank you. I looked, I literally looked at Barry and I said, that's how God works in our life, is he allows that. He, he knew this is going on five years. So five years is a milestone. You know, you do it. Well, so, see, the reason I interrupted you earlier when I was thinking, did you feel something? Because when you were talking and you started talking about, you could see, we went, I could see in your face. I can see because it was just barely like, gosh, this is crazy. Because it, it is. Because, because I seen your face and I was like, but there there was the, this tragic loss and the sorrow like, that your I face. But then, it. but then all of a sudden went, you, you literally in front of me right here just went, and I hope the camera picked it up because it was, and of course it probably did because you could see the transition, like, it just like the epiphany, like, yeah. it's okay. Okay. It's okay. It is okay. It's some, you know, yeah. That's hard for people to wrap their mind around. You have lost a child. <laughs> How can you even think that everything is okay? Because when you know the Lord and you have that relationship with the Lord and you have faith in Him, and that's us. He is so wonderful because He takes care of us. And he, again, with these pictures that you Yes. Use. Just, just another just, thing. Yes. Ain't that feel good? Oh. Like, so when I seen that, literally, at first, I felt horrible. And I'm going to tell you why. Because when I, she sent it to me on my phone, and I just kind of was flipping, and I seen that guy in like the u- ref uniform shirt, and I thought, oh, okay. I flipped past it. Didn't even know it was Barry. Because it's in like the... No, no, no. It's right here. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah, no, I got it right here. It's right here. This one. This right, right, here, right but here. it's in like the... You know how they print the book and it's in the front showing who's in the book? Yeah. At the big front of it? His picture's in the front of that, too. Okay. So, in the no, the it's right there. Yes. Number eight, page so 18. I yeah, didn't yeah. even pay attention to it. I thought, oh, okay. I kind of looked at it and glanced at it and I thought, okay. And then I flipped over and there was that picture. And then the first instinct, and again, this is how the devil, you know, he's just waiting for that. The negative. Door. He wanted yes, that negative. He yeah. It. He said, you didn't even recognize your own child. I cried. I thought, I'm so sorry. How can I not recognize my child? Yes, but he's been you were too excited years. to look at the middle. I <laughs> wanted to read the yes, article. Yes. So I got to the article, and then God said, I looked and I said, I don't have that picture. Where did they get that picture? But I'm so thankful because I have it now. Now, yeah. And two more to go. With. And yeah, and I was like, thank you, God. But people cannot, I would go back to work and I, you know, and they seen me go through that time because he died in May or in June. His birthday's May the 14th. So he had just been 20 just a few weeks. So in May, his birthday is right before Mother's Day, right around Mother's Day. So his death date is June when Father Day, Father's Day follows it. So you see the pattern there? So every Mother's Day, yeah, every Father's, Father's Day. Day. We have to deal with a birthday. And and that's great. Because you know what? Because then I get to think about all the good times that we had. Yeah. And so, June rolled around. I took two or three months off work. They told me just to come back whenever. But I began to get really depressed. Because I could not understand it. And this... now. Now, I'm not, I'm not where I am now. I am in today with my relationship with the Lord. I began, yeah, I can't imagine. Like, I, I began think. to let the devil have... He took up rent in my head. And that's when I began to think, I can't laugh. My child's not here to laugh with me. How can I even be happy? Because he's not here. I got, to the, I got so bad, Mike... I asked Barry to get me a tent so I could go sleep at the cemetery. But do you not, like, to most people, if they're not human, I have, I've already thought about that. <laughs> what would happen to me? What would, like, that's why I didn't want to hear this before I heard it from you. I really didn't. I really didn't because I was like, I've already had these thoughts about my, my child and these things, not like you've had thoughts. So please, don't, I'm not trying to be. No, no I, I get it. But like you're, you, of course, of course, you just want to be closer. Of course, you just want to be there. And I did. I want. I kept thinking to myself, if I could just die 
then I could see him because I know where he's at because I knew where I'm going. I know without a doubt that I'm going to heaven too. So I would be with him again. Just want to go away. Just want to go away. So I got severely depressed to the point that I probably didn't sleep. I, I don't recall sleeping the months of November, December, January, or February. I never Do you slept. recall them? I, no, I don't recall them. Yeah, that's the thing. I didn't you want got to depression, man. Yes, severely depressed. Didn't want to do Christmas. Didn't want to do Thanksgiving. He wasn't here. Why should we have, why should we have these holidays now? Nothing so, means nothing. No, it didn't. It just, and, nah. So, like I said, uh, Barry and I had been on a cruise uh, in November. We'd gotten off the cruise ship. It was a horrible cruise. It was, yeah, I was sick the whole time I was on the cruise ship. Sick. One day, I didn't even get off the boat when we docked. Stayed in my bed. I had a horrible headache. And so I know, looking back, that was part of the depression that I was going through. Um, because I, how could you enjoy this beautiful place? Because yeah. everybody because else is telling you, go away, go away. Let's be happy. We had promised him for his college graduation we would take him on a cruise. Yeah. And here we were on a cruise. He's we were it. doing something he wanted to do. And in my mind, I, I the devil was telling me, look, you're having a good time. He's not here. How do you think he feels now? Oh, I got you, so This is what's depressed. astounding is that I'm listening to you, both of you, because Barry, you're part of that. You've been, you've been speaking. And... Like that's that's really what the mind does to you. Yes, it does. When during during it, it doesn't matter what you think it is. If you're religious, not religious, whatever else, you're you're sitting there just going, yeah, man, yeah. Look at this. Look at this. Let's be negative about it. Let's be negative about it. When go ahead, Barry. And then the whole time we're on this cruise, it's a set. We decided to go because we've been on a five day. Yeah. And that was fine because we went with our brother and sister in law. We had extra people there to kind of buffer stuff. But this one we did on our own, and we did a seven-day. We jumped off and did a seven-day. And with her being so depressed, not wanting to do nothing, not wanting to hang out, I mean, literally, she just wanted to stay in the room, stay in bed. I had to drag her. That was the first time in a long time I fell off the wagon. And for seven days, I literally stayed bombed. And when we finally got back, she felt so bad because the way she felt on the boat, and we'd had some rough water and everything. I felt so bad because I knew what I'd done for the whole week. Thinking, well, I'm out here in the water, and nobody could see me anyways. Devil's but coming in anyway. It's I'd coming in, yeah. go back around the people in the church. I'd go around people, my friends and stuff, and I would know inside what I'd done all week. Yeah. So it was, a, it was this depression thing. It was eating her away. I'm trying to keep her going, but it's eating me away. We didn't know which way to go. Well, there is no really way. I mean, and there, the, there's nothing but the process of it. And what you guys were doing is we're, we're doing what most people would say the right thing. Go enjoy life. Go enjoy life. But with, like you're saying, and you're saying, the mind is going, I'm not ready to enjoy that no, life. We, we were both miserable. Yeah, so of course she's miserable, sick in the bed. Well, what are you going to do? You're like, you're trying to be comforting. You're trying to be loving. You're trying, but you're still dealing with your own battles, your own things. You're like, you know what? I'm going to the damn bar. <laughs> Fuck today. Excuse me. <laughs> Screw today. I'm going to the damn bar and nobody's here. Nobody's going to care. I'm going to sit here and get drunk all damn day and not worry about my problems for a minute. It was an escape. You know, and but, which both of you were intending to do together but like you said, like you said, here the memory, the thought, like you're going to go have fun while you're, well, this I, happened. Yeah, because that was what I kept hearing. How can you be having a good time when he's lying out there at the cemetery? And Mary would tell me, he's not there. And and even, as, I started going to a counselor and she kept saying, you need to be, you are so bad, you need to go in-house. And I'm like, I ain't going in-house. Well, the time that I had been convinced that I was going to go in-house, then here come those thoughts. Oh, so Barry's putting you in. He doesn't want to be with you. Look what you've caused. So the mind game starts again. And I look at Barry and I said, I'm not going. Oh, no, you're not putting me in there. He's like, what happened? You Literally, he walked to the bathroom. The counselor walked to make arrangements for me to go in-house. And in a split second, my mind had already played those games on me. And I, I'm not going. He's like, okay, we won't go. 
And so I opted not to go in-house for therapy. I continued therapy. And I'd gotten really sick. We'd been to the lake. Been to the lake with some friends of ours that have a lake house. Uh, I had got in the water to go swim up to like a waterfall and I couldn't breathe. Literally could not breathe. I can I, can I ask this, something yeah. this connection? Because there's so I, I like connections. In oh, patterns, that's fine. Okay? There's, there's a lot of things that you said earlier in the podcast and earlier during this discussion and then you're saying now is a lot of things are related to water. A lot of things are related to you both with water mm-hmm. and everything else. Is there, is there a reason with your son? Was there, was it, was it that? Oh, he loved water. Yeah. He, he yeah, It was swim just, right? was it a memory, the subconscious memory maybe uh, that made you do these things? I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Okay. Honestly. So anyway. Sandy and Madison had swam on up to the waterfall, and I got about halfway because Barry was on the boat with Mark, and I looked at him, and I said, I can't breathe. And he's like, okay. He said, go on. And I was like, no, I can't breathe. I need you to help me. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. I'm not and making so, levity of it. Yeah. Anyway, he jumps in, and he gets to me, and he's like, what's going on? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, let's just get up to the waterfall where it's cooler. We get to the waterfall, and I literally cannot breathe at all. And I kept saying, I need to take my life vest off. He's like, and Sandy's like, no, leave the life vest on. We'll get you back to the boat. Got back to the boat. I literally was in and out of consciousness on the boat ride back. I got off the boat, and their lake house is kind of uphill a little bit, so we were walking uphill while I started coughing up blood. And uh, I said, we got to get, we got to get to the doctor. And so we, we're at Hebrew Springs, Springs, so we load up. And so the first place we came to was Batesville. Yeah. And, and said I no. said, no, I'm okay. Just go on. And he's like, well, we get to Newport. And he's like, Michelle, Michelle, are you with me? And both windows are down. The air conditioner's is blowing right on me to try to get me some air. He said, are you with me? And I said, yeah. He said, do I need to stop at Newport? I said, no, they'll kill me. They'll let me die. They don't know what to do for me there. He's like, are you going to be okay? Do we get being the nurse see? that you are, <laughs> being the person you've seen this shit, you know, yes. so you've seen what Stop. they've got available. You ain't stopping. Um, I told him, I said, take, get me on to Jonesboro. So we got to NEA and my O2 sat, and that's where they check your oxygen level was at 81. And uh, What's a normal level? What's it normal? should be uh, 95 to 96. So I was okay, not so getting, you're 16 point, I was not getting any oxygen to my brain and through my blood system. No, very little. Why? I'm going to get that. Okay, thank you. So I'm anyway, my bad, my bad. <laughs> we, uh, they start running tests, and they're like, okay, let's do a chest x-ray. Uh, they come in and tell Barry, so well, it looks like she might have pneumonia, but we need to do a CT scan. Barry's like, okay. They did a CT scan, and I had pneumonia in both lungs completely full. I could not, my lungs were not functioning. The, the life is... Kept her alive yeah, while she was in the water. They, keeping the compression together? Right. Okay, and I got they you. they said if we would have taken that life vest off, I would have lost consciousness. So the life vest literally kept me alive. So anyway, I was in the hospital, uh, very, very sick, very sick, in there for about a week and a half. Um, I told Mary then, I said, I, I've got to change some things. And this was in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had not worked. Because I just, I didn't want to go back to the job that I had. Because every time I walked into that building, I kept replaying. Barry coming in and telling me my child had died. And I told him, I said, uh, <laughs> I'm, t- so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm looking here. I'm going, what a mind screw. What yeah. about you? You you ain't got, like, you, on the left side, right side, you ain't got, you know, you it's just. You heard so, you saying you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> no, no. It's like, like, uh, like how is, no. Yeah, so uh, here we are at our very side. What mm-hmm. are you going to do? And I was like, <coughs> I don't know. So I took a job at First Carriage up here at the stadium. Uh, I took a $5 cut in May. But I didn't care about the money. It that wasn't was, about that the was money. That was after taking a $12 cut. Yeah, I'd taken time. a $12 cut to come to NEA to work. But it was, we would already decided it wasn't a money issue. So I went to work up there, and I absolutely loved my job up there. Uh, at that point in time, I knew that I needed help with losing the weight. So I had weight loss surgery in December uh, 11th of 2017. Uh, in June of 2018, I got to train with, started training with Taylor. And uh, now, I, I, so it's just been a life transformation. I'm down 100 and roughly 112 pounds. Um, 
I needed that for myself. I needed to learn how to live again. And God has allowed that. He has allowed me to share my testimony of how my faith, just staying faithful to him. Because if we stay faithful to the Lord, he will stay faithful to us. He will provide in any situation. Because looking back, he kept me alive when I wanted to die. He yeah. did not allow me to die because that was not his plan. I, I have to be here for a reason. And my reasoning is to be able to help other people that's going through things like this, that are going to go through things like this. Barry and I have uh, started helped start a program here in Jonesboro called the Compassionate Friends of Northeast Arkansas. It is for parents that have lost children. And that's awesome. I wish, yes, we'll have to put that. Yes, yes. that's and awesome. And grandparents who have lost children and siblings who have lost siblings, obviously. But we have helped start that. Uh, we meet once a month on the third Tuesday of every month. And you just, if you want to cry, we cry with you. If you don't want to say anything, that's okay. But we knew that other people needed to know that they don't walk alone. And then they felt, well, you, like, they, they there's can, such a yes. dynamic to that. And you, know? you will be amazed. At, I am totally blown away with the people that have lost children in this community. Blown away. There is numerous in, in my family alone, I have a sister that has, she lost her 19-year-old daughter in a car wreck. I have a brother that had a son born, and he was still born, and then he lost his nephew the year after we lost our son. Or no, he lost his grandson the year after he, we lost our son. And so it's just, and I have a niece that has lost a son. So, and you know, it's just, and my mother lost a child at six months old, so... God has always played a part in our life that we could overcome. And then even in our church, we've got a lady that had two sons commit suicide. Yeah. So we just, you know, my life has not been an easy road, but I've loved my life. Like you said at the beginning, I...
problem we've got with our world today. If you are handed everything in life, you're going to fail. Because you're not going to know how to work for it. And you're not you, going to know how to come up from that failure. No, you are teaching those kids See, how to be a better athlete. Yeah. They don't realize it yet, but you're teaching them how to be better. I get them. I give. I like to give them a little bit. I That's like okay. give a little. Yeah, That's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I see some because, of them just... because here's the thing. Look at what you've accomplished yeah. in your life. Look at what you've dealt with. You dealt with the loss of a son, which we, tomorrow morning we have a 5K yes. in Brooklyn, Arkansas. Because of that, yes. we have books written about you in the Hall of Fame, three or four Hall of Fames. You have a book written, written about you. But because you were taught those those values of, look, it's going to get tough, but it's about to rise. Everybody's going to lose. Oh, yeah. You lose every day. You lose something. You lose your life. You lose whatever. It is, whatever. But you, where are you going? And you're you you both like that. What a damn great conversation that was! And I hope people really did listen because that that's inspiring in itself. That that's that's a beautiful story of just where you're at with your weight loss challenges, the depression you did with everything else. Where both of you are still together. You like you asked her to marry five times. That she didn't want to marry your ass. <laughs> she wouldn't want nothing to do with you. I, I, I'm, I'm the first to admit. I, I'm, I am very honest. I'm the first to admit, when we got married, I told her, I said, if you're really wanting to marry me, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, hang on. It's going to be a long, bumpy ride. Hey, she yeah. thought I was joking. It took her a good 10 years into our marriage. We've been married 26 years to get me lined out. I was a, I was, <laughs> no, he, he was I was just... a severe alcoholic by the time I was 15. I ran from church and everything. Joined the military when I was 17. Was married at 19, kid at 21, divorced at 22. Severe alcoholic again, four more years, running combat veteran. Come back still drinking, having PTSD, and not even know what PTSD is. Other health issues coming up because of where we were at in Iraq and stuff. And her trying to figure out what's going on in my mind for 10 years before we finally started getting answers. So, there was a lot she had to deal with with me. But then on top of everything else, the rest of our life, what we went through, and for me to stand up and say, she's got my back, I don't have to worry about it. I don't even have to tell somebody. I might throat punch him every now and then, but I don't hurt him. I heard Cindy throat punch him. I seen you throat punch him right before we started. She asked me when she started the workout thing. She said, will you work out with me? I'll do what I can. But as we've journeyed through this journey together, I've realized there's still a lot of stuff I can do. And I don't have the breathing I used to have, and I don't have the knees I used to have. <laughs> no, but there's saying. still a lot of strength there that I've still got. But do you see, do you, like, from a, my perspective, do you see this story that you guys have just created? Yeah. That's a beautiful damn story. That's beautiful. Yeah, through this and that, through this well, and that, the shit she put up with you, the you shit you put up with her, the, the back yeah, and forth. The two years that I was severely depressed, he would literally have to say, you need to get up out of bed today. You can't stay in that bed. You have to get a shower today. Two days is long enough. You're not going another day because you just want to quit living. And he never let me stop. And I'm thankful for that. That, but that's the thing. That's yeah. when you, that's awesome. I love your face. You, your face, I can see your emotions. It's, it's but awesome. Then, but then after she went back to work, I went through a depression because I'd spent two years taking care of her. Because she, now it's different. Now it's changed. Now you're lost. And nobody's taking care of me. Yeah. Because in a, in a way, was it like this? Like Because you were taking care of this and you were helping this, that gave you fulfillment to forget what now you I'm were, yes, yes. You know, you know, it's like I joke around, you know, because you know, we still had Barry Dodge Boxer until he died recently. But, you know, at the time I said, you guys don't understand. I'm talking to the dog and the dog's talking back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I have a friend. You know, you know, I'm sitting there watching TV and I'm watching myself <laughs> get bigger. I mean, I'm getting bigger. I got it to... Well, about 240 there. Mm-hmm. I got up to about 240. And five foot nine. And finally, and I mean, I was getting angry with people again. I, I used to be a person, when I sold cars, I didn't like people. 
I only liked you if I had, if you had, I was going to put something in your pocket or get something out of it. Mm -hmm. That's it. You were just, you was a mark. And I really had trouble with people. And I was getting that way again. And she talked to a couple people at church. And finally, one of the guys at church, Mark, he seen what I was doing. And he had a small cattle farm. And he literally pulled me out one day, took me to the cattle farm, and I worked out there for a year for free. Just helping him drive a tractor, do whatever, bail hay, do whatever we had to do. He ended up giving me a bull that kicked me and got my shoulder hurt, but <laughs> it tastes good now. But that year out there, doing all that physical and getting my mind away from it, it gave me, you don't realize how much you can talk to God driving on a tractor pulling a bush off when there's nobody else around. Ain't it amazing? Ain't it amazing? I love that. I love that. I really do because here's the thing. Ain't it amazing? And I can relate to this. Because when things were bad in my life and things were difficult and I didn't understand a lot, I said, man, I just want to disappear. I just want to disappear. I went out into the middle of a field and I lived in a camper. It was a big ass camper, but I lived in a camper and I was like, I don't need any of this stuff. Let me find me again. Let me find me. And it takes that. It takes, it really does. People have, people forget. You can only own so many motorcycles and cars and, and possessions. This, this, you know, people think tractors nowadays, you know, they think cabs and air conditioners. No, we're talking a little C50 case. Yeah. Pulling a Big wheel right next to your Yeah, yeah. pulling yeah. a 16, you know, pulling a uh, 8 inch bush hog mm -hmm. with no cab, no air conditioning. It's 120 degrees outside. But it gave you time to think. Yes. And I'd sit out here and drive for yeah. three, four hours at a time, just drive that tractor. Yeah. Just right. to show you, just to tell you how far I have been able to grow with the Lord and be able to tell our story, I did not fall apart. Before, I would fall apart just to mention of his name. Because it's so hard to speak of him when I can't see him. Yeah. But now when I speak of him, it's what will forever be because... The scholarship that we have started will be an endowment scholarship. That will be a lifetime scholarship. Barry and I will die. I read that. They, Barry, and a... I, Barry and I will both die before that thing. It will never stop. Yeah, because, because... no one explained that to people that don't <laughs> so understand that they don't get the education magazine. Because when you endow a scholarship, you sign a contract. You have to write, You have to pay $25,000 to endow a scholarship. So we knew we had to start raising money to get this to an endowment. We are $5,800 away from having it completely endowed. You have five years to do that. We've done it in four. Well, hopefully this this race. And tomorrow. Hopefully tomorrow. tomorrow. You know, if, it, if not, then we have a port steak fundraiser coming up where you can buy port steak plates, Boston butts, ribs, chickens that we ha will have for sale. We have a Charlie Brown and Paragol cooks for us, and we will sell those. So between the two fundraisers, hopefully we'll finish mm -hmm. that. Yeah, Dolly Place at 16. Yes, we have Doe's Restaurant downtown. Doe's, okay, yep. They are doing, we're on 16th April the 16th from 4, April. To, okay. from 4 to 9 at Doe's. So April 16th at Doe's. This yes. is the endowment fund for Barry yes, uh, Wire Jr. Yes, they will give 15% of everything they make that from 4 to 9 to his scholarship. Let's talk about the, before we go back to the 5K, what's, what's the one in a couple months? Uh we will have uh, May seventh. We got U.S. Pizza. Yes, May seventh. U.S. Pizza will donate fifteen percent between four to nine to his scholarship. But then April the twenty seventh is the Port State. Port State. Port State. Port State sales. Sales. Okay, yeah. so what we need to do is you got to make sure we get this. But, but tomorrow, the reason tomorrow we have the five K. It's the second yes. annual. Right now, we have forty one people signed up, so that's bigger than what we had last year. It will start at 8 o'clock at Brooklyn High School, and there will be trophies for all age divisions. You have good race Which bags. me and Tyler are not signed up because I'm a lazy fat dad, and I you get You can sign up the day of the I'll race. Be there. We'll be there in the morning together. That's but, fine. But let's, uh, the reason, the whole reason this was done today was because of this fund. Yeah. Because I wanted this on, because... People need to understand, like, this scholarship goes besides to the to help yes. the, the, the healing of the parents and everything else, just to make that memory. Like, look, look there's there's these managers I had in high school. Right, and, I had those, and so you know. people don't realize the managers don't get treated the same way. The no, they don't. The managers are there before the players and coaches get there. I can recall him being leaving the house some mornings at 4 o'clock in the morning 
to make sure the field was set up, the uniforms were done, the decals were done right on the helmets. And they are the last ones to leave that stadium at night time because then you have to do their laundry. You have to get Clean everything. It all up. You have to get up, yeah. everything hung up in their lockers. So this scholarship, what it will do, will go toward a manager of any sport. It's not just geared toward football. Uh, it will go to any sport. The coach will have to recommend you. You will write a letter stating what your career path is, and it has to do something with uh, exercise science. Uh, so, or sports, or sports right. one of the two. Then the scholarship will, Barry and I will get to set in on the top five students that are nominated, and we will get to decide who gets it. Well, I'm hoping tomorrow morning that there's enough people to come out. We don't have to worry about the. We've had some great audition. sponsors, uh, several, several great sponsors. Nuns Construction from Harrogold, York's Co- York Construction from Truman and Bay. Um, Shadrack's Coffee. Shadrack's Coffee. There will be Shadrack's Coffee and hot chocolate tomorrow morning. They donate every year to us. Kroger's right. donates bananas every year. Crown Trophy. Crown Trophy. She, Molly Calvert is my niece, and she donates all the trophies, all of the medals for the race. We don't get charged a dime for those. She donates them. Stern's Race, uh, Stern's race Simon. He has put on the race for us the past two years and has done great with us. We absolutely love Jim and Tracy. Um, running threads for some great shirts. Yeah, here. running, running threads. Running yes. threads. Yes, yes their shirts are awesome. Well, that's who yes. the shirts are done by. So, uh, we just are excited about it. I think you know this. The race was something we just kind of pulled out of the air and decided to do. Didn't know how well it would do the first year. Well, I think we put thirty thirty one hundred dollars in his scholarship, and there was thirty one people. Last year, it snowed, and we had freezing rain. We were out there racing. I personally did not complete the race. I quit at the two-mile mark and went home. <laughs> Barry did complete the race. But we had a good time. My coworkers show up every year, and it's just, they've backed me 110. St. Bernard's has been a big supporter in our with our fundraisers. And so we are excited about it, and we hope people will come out. If you can't come out to race or walk, come out and support the person that you got going walking or racing, and just have a good time. Look, there, look, to the people that are going to watch this live, the people going to replay this and everything else, you can always donate to this. Absolutely, this is something you can donate to. Don't be stingy. You've got a couple bucks. You got twenty bucks. Don't be. I mean, Absolutely. I'm going to talk in my words. Don't make a bunch of punk asses. Like, give to this. This is something that is important. This is something important to, to me, to people that are watching this, to people that are the, the parents, everything else, but as, as well as the memory of somebody that was important to the whole entire Arkansas state. You know, so it's, it's, it and is, yes. Yes, I, yes, I, that, that should be the least of your worries. It Throw your 20 be. bucks and shut your mouth. <laughs> Put it in there. Give a hundred, get this through an endowment so that it's a lifelong thing. For Barry we Clark hope it Jr. gets that way so we can give the first scholarship in August. And what we will do is Barry and I will take out of our pockets the first amount of scholarship because it needs to sit for a year to for the entrance to grow so they can give the first one. But if we can get the 25000 before yeah. then, Barry and I are taking out of our pockets and giving them. We'll have that 25000 You're absolutely they, they, right. They, you, we will. will have that 25000 We're absolutely. actually hoping by the end of April to be in endowment. And once it legally goes into that IRA and in endowment, once it legally does that, we can say, okay, coach is not made. Yep. And we're so by August, we want to be giving out the first scholarship for Barry. And I can pull, the first scholarship will be $500. Mm-hmm. That's 250 per semester. Mm-hmm. People think, well, that's kind of, 250 buys a lot of books. Yeah. Or they, a, there's your books. There's or your, or your food plan. Or something. It doesn't matter. Like, look. This is something that's awesome, like, and it'll keep growing. I have no doubt between the passion. Well, we will continue two. even after the twenty five thousand is raised yeah. and it's an endowment. Yeah, that's... Barry and I will continue to do the five k every year and do at least one other fundraiser to continue to put back. This in is a legacy for you it guys. Is, as absolutely. Well. This is legacy yes. for you guys as well, and this is but, an awesome. But the good news is, once we get to endowment, we do get to slow down just a little bit. <laughs> well, it's been a you know, and that's the thing. You guys are working really hard. You've got five, six fundraisers. In the next five weeks, you know, if people you know, don't understand, you know, if the way people look at maybe what you know, we were talking earlier about her salary of five hundred dollars, yeah, a month. Amazing. When we were growing up, you know, 
Two things were guaranteed, or three things. One, there was no GoFundMe. You wanted yeah. to GoFundMe, you went out and pushed the lawnmower or washed the car. Yeah, you're doing like something. Number two, there was no participation trophies. <laughs> you either, you yeah. either won or you didn't. Yeah. There was winners and losers. But number three, back then $500 is a lot of money. We thought five years to do 5000 That That shouldn't be no problem. Wrong. Wrong. It's been a lot. It's been a hard journey. We've There's been times me and her was looking at each other ready to pull each other's hair out <laughs> because we were trying to figure out how to get these fundraisers to work. Yeah. I am a person that when it's set <coughs> in my head, I go, go, go. That's what I do. And we've it. had fundraisers that just flopped. Yeah. And I mean, it's so technically difficult. It is. It is. It really is. I know in the aspect of as far as sponsors for myself, when you're trying to fight, you're trying to do these things. But, you know, you need help. You need some type of help. And that's why I wanted to do this. Is that's why you guys are like this is awesome. And I you this is, tomorrow morning, get your ass up. <laughs> if you're listening to this, if not listening later, whatever you're doing, you know, donate to the Barry Wire and Junior Endowment Fund yes. to Arkansas State. Make sure I saying that right. But get you can give something, make sure this legacy lives forever. Because you know what? Here's what I do know, besides doing the experience, and I didn't want to know a couple of stories before tonight, and I'm glad I know him now, but I knew how important he was to other people. Absolutely. And it, it's a very cool thing for you guys to know that. It's very cool. It's a very cool thing you guys are doing. I you appreciate know, it. Just like, is it Casey? The masseuse? Cassie. Cassie. Cassie, yeah. Like, she, when you posted it, she said, hey, where do we get this shirt? And then she told me she worked with him. We still meet people that have worked with him that we didn't yeah she worked work. with all four of them she she knows she she's the mind massage therapist for the past 10 years oh, wow. that i've been here every like she shows up at nine o'clock and i'm like cassie i'm hurting man i'm hurting i'm hurting like because i'm an old man i've had some problems and everything else but i i, I still look good but <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm so big but no she 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 got emotional because she knew you know she, she knew and barry and she's like i could tell yesterday when i met her and I mentioned his name, I could just, like, she took it. No, out. she did. She really did. Yeah. Because I've never seen it like that. Because she got real, I didn't know she knew. I said, do you know that? I'll, I'll give you another good Barry Don story. <laughs> when Barry Don was 16, and I, I'd sold his godfather, I would, would buy his cars for me. He was my best friend. We've been best friends for 39 years. He had traded his car for a new car and I took it to Batesville and got it and brought the other one home I told Michelle on the way home I said I'm going to buy that car for Barry Don because I knew the car I'd sold it to him and it was a good car to take care of well that year when he turned 16 he conned us in to let <laughs> him and two other guys and one girl go to St. Louis to warp tour and we was leery especially with the one girl going but the girl's mother you know she said it's okay they're good they, you know, we've known each other blah 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 well, the next thing was we had to get them a hotel. And <laughs> you know as well as I do, 16-year-old kids don't get a hotel. I go to St. Louis a lot. I barely get a hotel. So, I'm 40. You know, I called. I talked to the guy and the guy said, well, it's normally not. I said, well, look. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you my credit card number. If they break anything or do anything like stupid, just call me before you charge the card and let me know what you're going to charge it for. You really do that? Yeah, I do it. They're good kids. So I called and checked the next day while they was at the concert. I called and checked the guy. He said, man, he said, they came in, they dropped their bags off, went got something to eat, come back, slept, they're gone to the show. He said, they've already said, wake up, call for in the morning, check out the head home. I said, nothing's wrong. I said, okay. So they did this every year. Well, the last year he went, they, the, the whole thing was he was coming home the next morning to get the car and everything so he could go get his tickets for they was getting ready to go back to work to her for the fourth year. Mm -hmm. And uh, about three, four months after his died, yeah, we had had a picture in Facebook. Somebody reported his that we didn't memorialize his Facebook, so they dropped it off, or we can't get it back. But there was a picture of him and this blonde-haired girl. On we didn't know her. It was that warped her, and it was about three or four months after he passed away. Michelle gets a message out of the blue on Facebook. It was this blonde-haired girl. He had met her up in St. Louis, and she told Michelle the story how they met at Warped Tour that last year, 
and it, their favorite band was the same band, and they was up at the front of the stage. And he the whole had time. gotten backstage and, passes for her favorite group, so he took her backstage. To backstage with her, then they come back out and watch the show and held hands through the whole show. And, <laughs> and she they, contacted you guys. Yeah, yeah, and she put, awesome. they had planned on meeting again at Warped Tour. When she went to Warped Tour and he wasn't there, she got to looking on Facebook and found out something was wrong, and that's how she found out he passed away. But she'd sent Michelle this whole story about how they had met and got to liking each other. We didn't even know. Yeah. Because he kept his personal life so personal. limited and so personal. His whole philosophy was God, football, family. Without God, there's no football. Without football, I can't take care of my family when I get older. Because he Did wanted you know to be what? a coach. Yes. Yeah. Did yeah. you know what he told us? Just remember, I choose your nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> and he told Barry, he said, you're going to Green Acres. Mom's going to Chateau on the Ridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't win. The, the, but the but, fact is, you recognize my shirt, so yeah, I had to say the Green Acres. But, yeah. you know, he's, he's, it was that way. He kept his personal life personal, his professional life professional, his academic life his academic life. He, for a 20-year-old kid, he had it lined out. Yeah. He knew which direction he was going to go, and he what, knew where his priorities were. Now that it's, that's, however you want to say it, you know what I'm saying. Now that that's in the past. Now that's in the past, thank you. What a gift that is for somebody Absolutely. to come and give you a story from somebody where he, you didn't even know her. And Just like yesterday. Yeah. And her telling me, you know, he's a he was a great kid. Just the other day, and I don't see Ron Carroll, he is the... Uh, Athletic trainer. Yeah, at ASU. I don't see him and I don't talk to him personally. But something was, I think you posted something about it. And he commented he was a very great worker. So we still, five years later, we still hear how good he was. Or how, Jerry, what, Jerry Mahadra, every time he sees us, he tells us how much he misses Barry Dyer and how great a person he was. So I know you talked about Alabama earlier, but, you know, Gus Malzahn reached out personally to us after Barry Dyer was killed. Because Barry Don worked for him when he was here, we got to go to Auburn, and <laughs> no, seriously, thing. I coached. I was a strength conditioning coach for Arkansas when Gus was there that first year. Really? Yeah, I was there. I was there uh, two years before I turned pro in fighting. So we, we I protected we, Gus's ass when yeah. Marcus said there's some little controversy, but Gus is a good guy. He, Gus is a straight up good guy. Yeah. I'm just going to personally tell you, he was not my favorite. And so when he reached out and invited us to go, I looked at Barry and I said, seriously. I mean, because he came to Arkansas State. I'm not one and done. Well, you know, yeah, we knew what you were coming here for. It was just to go back. So when he invited us, I told Barry, I said, I really don't have a desire to go. I don't look good in Auburn colors. <laughs> so, yeah, I just don't. And Barry's like, well, it's the least we can do. Because Barry Don's um, quarterback, Ron Applin, was yeah, there. Applin, yeah. Yes, was there. And, well, and David Gunn. And David Gunn. And they both thought the world of Barry Don. So, our motive was we would go and be be with them and talk with them. Well, Gus took time after the game, after his personal interviews, he took time for just us. Awesome. And talked to us. And He told us, he said, you know, he said, Barry Don was my favorite equipment manager. He said, not that I didn't like the others. He said, but Barry Don was the only one that would pick back at me. Yeah. Give, a, give, a little, yeah, give a little bit of bye, bye, bye. Give a little shoulder so, rubbing, yeah. When you can impact a coach, and this is how I look at things, when when in his time there at ASU that he impacted the coaches that they wanted to pay respect to him. Because Gus didn't have – Gus well, left. He I, didn't I, say shit to you all. Yeah, he, didn't, he, 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 didn't, he didn't even he acknowledge it. He's been gone it. three years. Yeah. He's been gone three years, so why would he even need to acknowledge? Exactly. You know, even so Coach Carson, my, who's at Boise State, he reached out yeah. to us. So in my you know, mind, these coaches respected. He showed them respect, and they respected him back. I mean, Coach Anderson at ASU had just come on board. Didn't the they first were on the road. The first thing he asked Barry is, was he a Christian? Was he saved? And Barry said yes. And he said, I had not gotten to know all of them yet. But you've come into a group of boys, and not one, but he endured two deaths at ASU. Marco Owens had been killed that January when he went home for the Christmas. There crosses on the back of the helmet. Yes, yeah. and then yep. we, we yep. had to go through that. And a lot of people, 
we went to Memphis Bots and Friends weekend. We were live from Memphis for New York, and they got angry because I would not side with the people that wanted the crosses. I didn't. I was not going to speak negative of ASU. ASU had been great to us. Have always been great to us. And I told them, you will not get me to get into a controversy about that cross. I'm yeah. not going to. It, what it a does, ridiculous thing. Yes. What a you ridiculous know, I'm thing. I'm not going to tell you that I think they should be on there. And I told them, live, I will back ASU and Coach Anderson 110%. With whatever they decide, I am not going to be bitter about it. I'm not going to be upset about it. So instead of having the cross, Mark L. Owens' shirt, his jersey shirt was on the sideline, and they had Barry's, Barry Don's uh, manager shirt on the sideline oh. hanging, his polo that he wore every game. At that bowl game that year, um, they gave me that shirt. That was the last shirt he had worn at ASU, and they gave me that shirt. So, you know. Do you have that, on, do you have that put away? I do. It's in the hope chest. Yeah. 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 So, and she wears the visor every now and then. Yeah, I do wear the visor, and Barry Don had given me uh, that year – they had done the pink hats and the pink gloves and watch or socks, and he gave me his pink hat. He couldn't give it to me because they had to wear it for the month of October. Yeah. But after the game, the final game in October, he took it off his head and gave it to me, and it's got his initials on the inside of it. That's awesome. Yeah. So. Guys, I appreciate you guys. Hey, we enjoyed awesome being here. Night. Thank you for having us. No, that was awesome. I mean, I appreciate it. I uh, hope everybody that's watching. You know, it, you don't have to make it to the 5K tomorrow. If you can, be there. Show some support, show support for ASU, for the parents, for this, everything that's going on right now. But if you can't, donate. Don't throw a little bit of money at it. Get get the endowment fund done. We'll get it taken care of. We will. You, know, you guys keep working hard. Thank I mean, you. That's Thank an you awesome story. Thank you. Good job. Love it. That was awesome.